Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode one seventy five. I believe. Oh my goodness, we're only a, we're only twenty five away from two hundred. We better start planning something fun. Talk about crypt keeper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Listen, by, for, by the way, the last time we saw each other, or the last time we recorded, that motorcycle was not there. And also, uh, happy birthday! <gasps> happy birthday! I know we. It's been a, a wild couple of weeks for I think probably everyone on the planet. Um, I think globally, yes. So we decided, uh, instead of being our usual asshole selves, that we would maybe just put our birthday aside for a brief moment and right. focus on the rest of the planet. So um, we are very appreciative for ev- to everyone who was um, understanding and supportive of our decision to not record an episode for the first time Ever. in 175 episodes. Um, it just felt like the first time that it was like, this is the right thing to do. Um, and so instead, we didn't just sit around. A lot of people were like, oh don't just sit around and you know not do anything that's not what we were doing some people thought like because it was conveniently on our birthday week yeah like we took it as like a way to not record no like "Ah, no no we were being you know the best version of white people we can be and we were out there doing everything we could to um you know do our part in what's going on right now and yeah, I mean, and I know it should it should not obviously have taken this these incidents to like get us to that point, but um, I think this was definitely a big wake up call, and um, it was just a crazy week. I mean, we were trying to really, really delve in and like educate ourselves and listen to you know different voices, um, black creators, support them instead of supporting ourselves for a week. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I was actually really. I just want to give a little shout out. I was very proud. My little sister and her, a couple of her classmates, organized a demonstration in Cincinnati and I went expecting there to be like eight people and there were like 2,500 and she did a little speech on like a megaphone about wearing your mask and like staying you know safe and it just I was the proudest big sister I swear Gen Z is gonna save our damn lives someday I'm telling you that's a goddamn fact if it's not them (laughs) it's gonna be their kids I mean it's one of the two it's not us (laughs) we're trying I mean that's crazy I mean I did not know that that happened. Wow, that's incredible. I was very proud. And like, I don't know if I even told you that there was so much going on, but Lisa Lampanelli drove down. She literally called us the day before and was like, I'm driving down to join the demonstrations in Cincinnati because I don't want to go to demonstrations in like Connecticut. I want to come to Cincinnati. So we went to one on Saturday, one on Sunday. It was really great, beautiful, awesome music and speakers. And um, it was just a really great way to put, you know, everything else aside for a little bit and, uh, you know focus on on what needs to matter right now i so the ones i've been to have only been peaceful and yeah you know not that to say that yours weren't but i do want to you know give everyone a shout out to you know the people who have been going and everyone has been doing their part in uh unifying but also being really respectful of the covid you know nonsense mm-hmm. that's still also going around it was really um at least the ones we went to, everyone was wearing masks and like not necessarily six feet apart in some areas, but there were, you know, me and Allison, we were protesting and making sure that we kept a distance from people. And um, it didn't always feel like we were directly in the crowd at some points, but there were other people like that. And it felt like everyone was super respectful of the fact that people were just trying. Yeah. And, you know, I just want to give a shout out to people that like, you know, if you're it's a it's a weird time because people are scared to leave the house for very yeah. good reasons, but also you know a lot of people, including us, are enraged and feel like there's no other reason on earth to leave the house during a pandemic except to stand up for people. Totally. And uh, so it's it's nice to see everyone working together in a time where, by the way, we we were already tested to be working together in ways that the world has never seen. And we're now just doing it in a totally other wonderful geopolitical way. So yeah, the only like Gemini thing I was thinking the whole time at these um, demonstrations was like every time there were like news or camera crews or whatever, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be in a documentary someday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, kidding. They'll I'm, all I'm see. Totally they'll kidding. all see. My grandchildren will be so proud. No, I'm totally kidding. uh, It was very cool. And it well, it's also really scary just to think like 
2020, remember, people keep tagging me in this on Twitter. They're like, at the beginning of 2020, Christine said, like, this is our year. Um, things are going to just be so <laughs> fun and s- easy and whatever. I'm like, what the fuck was I thinking? Um, so I jinxed everyone. I And then I said in the quote, I literally said, I hope this doesn't jinx it. And everyone's like, Christine, God damn it. So I want to formally apologize. There's been a few people who have, uh, uh, there's a few tweets I've seen where like people are saying like now with, you know, everything that's gone on in this fucking year, there's going to be like historians one day that specialize in a specific quarter of 2020. Like, what the hell? <laughs> like, and then I saw this thing on, this is like, you know, not to take away from the gravity of everything. I just, just seeing what's going on socially, I think there's a lot of, you know, really wonderful, impactful posts, but I also follow Reddit and there's this one girl who did an AMA who was like, I recently just like underwent um, like some brain surgery and I'm having some swelling. And so I have temporary memory loss. I don't know what's, and she was like, I don't know what's going on. Or someone was like, someone was like, has anyone told you about what's going on this year? (laughs) And she was like, my earliest memory is from when I was seven. I don't know what's going on. And (gasps) and everyone was like, who wants to tell her? Like, yeah, don't, don't. How do you, and they listed everything from like almost World War Three, Australia's on fire, the government confirmed UFOs, Kobe's dead. Also, like, I mean, all these things that we've literally already forgotten about compared to like the last two massive fucking problems. Because the pile that just keeps getting bigger, and like, I, it's totally true. And then like, J.K. Rowling is now just like enemy number one. It's the whole world. It's like, don't ruin Harry Potter for this girl who is who is seven in her mind. Like, don't. a lot of people are, se- are have been tagging Daniel Radcliffe as like yes. the chosen one, as he <laughs> always has been. But uh, no, not to take away from the the severity of what's going on, and we also, you know. Obviously, this is the most minimal fucking struggle that anyone's going through right now. But we as podcasters and specifically, you know, true crime podcasters feel like we have a responsibility. But at the same time, we're also comedy podcasters. And so we had this weird tango, you know, separate, you know, we had it privately where we were like, it would be wrong as two white comedians Mm -hmm. who it's who are known to go kind of bananas on their birthday literally the week of our stupid birthday this is not the time to like either pretend nothing's going on or to get you know kind of dark and serious where it's needed so it was just probably better for all of us to you know be more productive than that and so you know we've been obviously protesting and signing petitions and donating and doing everything we can educating screaming at our like conservative white families Mm. and doing our part and i think another part of it too is like we had a weird you know tango as em said about trying to figure out you know as much as it is i believe our responsibility as well to like highlight these kinds of things that specific week you know we committed to amplifying black voices and creators rather than like oh it's our turn to talk about what's happening like we can do that any week of the year and I will like I do plan on covering you know this more often which I'm ashamed to you know say it took this to get there but um yeah I think this past week that was really why we kind of shut down um I guess not shut down we just kind of stepped back it was just better and you know I feel like some people could see it as silence which is the exact opposite of what we want to do but um we and we personally don't see it as silence we saw it as we were taking the time instead of doing seven hours of notes we were doing seven hours of protesting and you know getting out there and helping and seven hours of researching and seven hours of educating and seven hours of listening and trying to give you guys like a like a a little bit of I know it's helpful to have a little bit of direction and so we wanted to share with you what we were doing which is if you guys didn't end up listening to it um there's a a uh, tinyurl.com/blmforever which has been really useful as far as petitions and which protests are going on and they update it regularly that's not our link or google doc somebody created that but um so that's just you know if you're still kind of hoping to uh, keep this movement going which we do hope to. Um, yes. That's a really so, helpful link. Yes. So the last thing we're going to say is for those of you who need to hear it, black lives fucking matter. If you feel differently about that, please stop listening to the show. 
<laughs> if your instinct is all lives matter, oh, where have you been? <laughs> if you even want to question the conversation, please just turn this podcast off. And also, like, we're not going to argue, like, I mean, we'll argue or we'll defend our position, but we don't, we're not, like, the all lives matter thing, if you haven't, it hasn't been explained to you yet and you still are in that boat, then, like, you're not going to, I guess... We Listen can't help what you. We have to if, say, yeah. <laughs> if people have explained it a hundred times to you, we're not going to be the hundred first that that does the trick. Maybe do some inward work. Um, yes. So anyway, that's where we stand. Yes. And, you know, over the years, we have gotten criticism of the show becoming political. But at this point in the this world, this is not it's, a political. It's issue. not political. That drives it's, me crazy. It's, it's a human issue. Like it's literally a human issue. If you think it's a political issue, again, look inward, please. So. Moving on, kind of, but not really, um, because we did want to make sure that we didn't want to look like shitty white people and then think like, okay, well, we did our part and did, you yeah. know, and stepped aside for one episode and now life is totally normal. We wanted to cover stories that are a little more topical, but, and again, how do you do that as a comedy show? So we, we struggled and please be patient with us, but we, at least I tried really hard on this story um especially because it's supernatural and i was like how the fuck am i gonna tie that in <laughs> um so it was quite a a, a an algebraic equation for me if you Whoa. will so i the fanciest sentence i've ever said um i also want to say to make things a little more lighthearted, where we can all laugh at me about something i literally christine remember i so we started recording at 11 this morning it's currently around 11 at least I'm in California. Yeah. Um, and I text Christine 10 minutes before uh, signing on. I was like, oh, I'm waking up right now. I literally stayed up until 830 in the morning doing these notes. Oh, no. Um... And so I took a hot two hour nap. And so <gasps> I just want to apologize in case I don't seem totally right in the head because i'm truly running on steam right now do you need a juice box or something i have a bag of marshmallows actually and so (laughs) i've just been taking like massive hits of sugar one at a time so fantastic sorry i don't know if i can show the brand but anyway if you if you want to look at this (laughs) it's like beauty blogger (laughs) (laughs) um yes they are they helped me get through last night and they're helping me get through now so um so my story actually has been suggested by a few people, especially because I this isn't necessarily supernatural. It's conspiracy theory, which is something that I'm I do cover. Please refer to Project Pegasus, probably my favorite episode I've ever covered, and it wasn't even about ghosts. Um, but a lot of people have asked about this, especially because I recently tweeted about them, especially because they have they are part of the uh, the news that's out there right now. So um, I am covering Anonymous. Yay! Oh my God, I am so ready for this. Which, by the way, is a fucking wild ride. And I do want to say I'm going to try to speak quickly because I do have a lot of notes. I literally did this until eight in the morning, so I've got a lot to say. Um, But I also want to do it justice. And also, like, I swear to God, if you're listening and you or someone you know is a member of Anonymous, I do not want you to do anything to me or this podcast. So I'm, I wanted to make sure I did as much justice as possible because I do not want to piss them off. And the more I read about them and the more delirious I got, the more scared I got. So okay, if you are an anonymous, I respect you. This is like, it's like finally I'm telling a ghost story about ghosts who could haunt me if I piss them off if I say the story wrong. So now I'm like, please Please, please, please. You're like in my shoes when I cover like Scientology and shit. (laughs) (laughs) Truly, I understand why you haven't covered it because like you're like, I don't want you to fuck around with me. If you are an anonymous, I do this with love and light. And if I say anything inaccurate, please tweet me. I am at VM Schultz and let me know and I will absolutely throw in corrections in the next episode. Please do not hurt me. Okay, moving on. Hello. Fresh. <laughs> Hello, fresh everyone. Uh, <laughs> How are you? Good, fresh. Hello, fresh. Okay. Such anyway, freaking morons. Uh, we want to talk to you about Hello Fresh. Em, take it away. Okay. Here's the thing, guys. If you don't know what Hello Fresh is yet, you're clearly new to the show. Welcome. Come on. It's us. Okay. 
HelloFresh uh, offers pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. And it's America's number one meal kit that lets you skip those trips to the grocery store and makes cooking fun, easy, and affordable. It's got all the perks. I got to say, since we just moved to a new place, we didn't have like any groceries or anything. And thank God, like the second day we got here, our HelloFresh box arrived. And I was like, we can have a real dinner in our new house without having to run to the grocery store and try and figure out what we had at home. And it's I highly recommend they literally deliver it contactless to your doorstep. So you don't have to worry about going out and getting anything. Um, No germs. Don't worry. And you can save up to 28% by using HelloFresh instead of going grocery shopping. Also, there's uh, something for everyone. It includes low calorie, vegetarian, family friendly recipes. Um, there's, um, you know, fresh, high quality ingredients every week, super flavorful, you know, meals. Like I've never, I don't think had one that I didn't enjoy. Mm-hmm. There's, uh, there's a few currently that are probably still sitting in my belly happily. Um, there is this garlic herb butter steak um, and lobster tail. I like, I, we all know how I feel you know, NBD, just like a secondary lapse of lobster tail. But yeah, so there's, uh, there's butter steak, which is exactly what I'm focused on. And they brought back their, um, their, uh, crispy chicken, uh, their, what was oh, yeah. their um, crispy Parmesan chicken. And it's got like garlic couscous and roasted carrots and it's super tasty. And every time it shows up, I'm so excited. It's the best. You can go to hellofresh.com slash 60 drink and use code 60 drink to get $60 off your first three weeks, including free shipping on your first box. Additional restrictions apply. Please visit hellofresh.com for more details. That's hellofresh.com slash 60 drink and use code 60 drink to get $60 off your first three weeks, including free shipping on your first box. For all our sakes, we need to avoid crowds any way we can right now. What if you need postage to send out letters and packages, uh, things like that? Don't worry because stamps.com is here to help. Thank God for stamps.com. I will say it till my dying breath. Stamps.com lets you print postage on demand and skip those lines and crowds at the post office. Plus, you can actually save money with discounts you can't even get at the post office. And as if that wasn't enough, stamps.com also offers UPS services with discounts up to 62% and no UPS residential surcharges. It is a win-win all around. Win, 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 or a win, 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 as Michael Scott would say. <laughs> um, Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your computer in the safety and comfort of your home, office, or anywhere else you are hunkering down right now. And whether you're a small business sending invoices or an online seller shipping out products or you're just working from home and need to mail stuff, uh, Stamps.com can do it all with ease. Uh, before we moved, I was trying to get rid of some stuff in my house and I was trying to sell some things off. And the last thing I wanted to do during quarantine was go to the post office. So thank God for stamps.com. I had that little digital scale. I got to print the postage right in my office and just mail it out. And the mail carrier literally picked it up from outside my door. It was amazing. Just the easiest Uh, thing on earth. Honestly, saved my butt. Right now, our listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in drink. That's stamps.com. Enter drink. Drink. Stay safe, my... Oh. Stay safe, my friends. Now freak me out. I'm ready. Okay. So for those of you who don't know what Anonymous is, by the way, because I... I tweeted about it and I was looking through the comments, not just on mine, but on other people's co- t- tweets about Anonymous. A lot of people today don't know who Anonymous is. And it was kind of a bigger thing back in like, I'll say like 2006, seven, eight. Yeah. No, I would say actually probably closer to like 2008, nine, 10. Um, and so it was right around when like I was graduating high school, I would hear about them. And so basically they're the, this uh, <clears throat> secret not so secret uh hacker group that is based out of 4chan which i know everyone's got opinions about 4chan <laughs> we're gonna talk about it and by the way there's gonna be parts of this story where people probably hate me a little bit because i have to talk about the really uncomfortable things during a topical climate so i'm just reporting the news okay um <clears throat> so i want to say i I got all this information from the documentary from 2012, We Are Legion, which is the longer version of that title is We Are Legion, the story of the hacktivists. And so um, it was written and directed by Brian Knappenberger. And I'm telling you right now, I don't mean to take away like the ability to watch it yourself, but I watched it and it had so much information that like I couldn't even do the notes any better justice so a lot I'm talking like a lot of my notes 
come from specifically this documentary. And if you were to watch it, you're going to say that it's almost like, like chapter for chapter or something, because I just, I, it just was really well put together. Um, and I also used Wikipedia and a couple other sites just to find some additional missions that they went on or things that they did. But most of the information is from the documentary, We Are Legion, which even though I'm about to report on it, you should watch it. It's really, really good. Okay. And to start off, I'm going to read several of the quotes. These weren't all next to each other. They were just some of my favorite quotes to describe anonymous to people who have never heard of them before. Um, So I'm just going to read them back to back. um, And these are all from that documentary. The first one, and they actually like interviewed people in anonymous. This isn't like historians or sociologists talking about this. These are actual anonymous members that went in front of the camera and are talking about themselves. Um, Okay. The first quote is, we stand for freedom. We stand for freedom of speech, the power of the people, the ability for them to to protest against the government, to right wrongs, no censorship, especially online, but also in real life. Okay. Another one is, we are one voice, not individual voices. That's why we don't give, that's why we don't show our faces or give our names. We're speaking as a collective. So for people who know who Anonymous is, they all wear like the Guy Fox mask. And so you never know who they are in public. So that's a lot of people wonder why they do that. And it's because they want to speak as one unit and be seen as one being. Mm-hmm. Um, they are, quote, individual, young, nameless, faceless folks who have who are making geopolitical impact, which is both exhilarating and terrifying. They are people who have a commitment to exposing and humiliating the man who have a very low tolerance for lies and what they perceive as overleaning power structures. And then my favorite one is they call themselves the final laws of the Internet. If you are going to violate the freedoms of the Internet, you certainly better watch the fuck out. Oh, shit. <laughs> so I have a quick question. When they're being interviewed, they're they're still anonymous, right? Like, they're not like, hey, no, I'm Jeff. They're literally faces, first and last name on screen. Really? Which, by the way, freaked me out because I would imagine if, like, you're afraid of, like, getting called out, like, everyone now knows your first and last name and That's your That's kind of weird. Okay. Maybe I imagine they're, like, so immersed in the community that people already know who they are so they're not afraid to announce who they are or um i know some people are were former members oh Um, there's a lot of people who ended up getting arrested for certain things and so maybe now that they're um you know now that they've done their sentence maybe they're not like active in it yeah exactly okay so um but some people seemed like they were still in it seemed i'm not sure but seemed it So before we get into um, what Anonymous is, let's talk about how hacking even came to be. So, uh, which I think, again, the documentary did a really good job of. So I learned from that movie that um, hacker culture began at MIT. Um, Surprisingly, not in computers or engineering or anything like that. It was actually in the Model Railroad Club. What? And so they would... Apparently hacking comes from pranks. Like they were just like, they were a group of like really goofy people in the model railroad club. With also like brilliant brains, I guess, from MIT. (laughs) And so they would just like prank each other as friends. And so it's since they kind of had some knowledge into engineering as a railroad club, they started kind of hacking into systems with the total intent of making things funny. So like they would change like lights, they would change different color lights or they would Um, There was one picture that I saw on the documentary where like they messed around with like an entire building's worth of light. So it spelled out words like (gasps) at night in the windows and so things like that, like just goofy things. And then it started turning into, um, I guess, those people had friends and slowly engineering and technology people got involved in these little pranks. So it got more advanced technologically. Whoa. So um So people started learning how to hack because they wanted to make funny pranks and, you know, do it through some really interesting engineering that hadn't happened yet. So people started learning how to hack. And by doing this, it's interesting socially and psychologically and also in the vast realm of what information means. They, by learning how to hack just to make pranks, they were inadvertently expressing what people could do with information or how it could be used. If that makes sense. Oh, yes, totally. 
So there was one, uh, I think, I don't know if he was necessarily an anonymous person, I remember, but he seemed to be like kind of more of a expert on the history of it. And so um, he was saying that they were inadvertently showing how information could be treated and also should be treated mm. because since they were learning all of these skills and by pranking, they were actually coding. And so they were learning how to build all these random softwares and programs that now that they had made them, it was like, okay, well, this is, there's you know, we made it. We should be able to, there's a use for it and we should be able to use it how we see fit because we made it. Oh, well, this reminds me a lot about like when I would attempt to put pink glittery skulls on my MySpace and then suddenly I was like, wow, I can code a website. I have that exact note in my notes. Oh, <laughs> okay, good. Uh, yeah, I mean, we all knew I would bring up MySpace eventually. <laughs> I love when you talk about your pink glitter MySpace page. I remember like making it and then being too embarrassed because it had like skulls and like, then I was like, I'm too embarrassed. So I removed it and then I put it back. Then I made the sk- skulls less glittery because I thought that was less embarrassing. Mine always had, um, it was always either like the typical Vans logo, like the checkerboard, <laughs> yeah. or it was like, this like ocean waves it was like Ooh. so so basic so like jimmy buffet stuff. or like Vans. like a jimmy buffet or like a warp tour kind of vibe warp tour with depending on my jimmy angst buffet. that week <laughs> yeah can you imagine a, a jimmy buffet star headliner, starring- <laughs> headliner. <laughs> that's our By music way, festival it's literally just jimmy buffet but we call jimmy buffett why do we keep saying it like you did um jimmy it's buffett, like how my dad calls the sci-fi channel the siffy network so i know it gets in your head like half as hardly i can't get it out one day i would like for my birthday for us to have a jimmy buffet themed buffet oh i see okay well all right we got to include something for me because i'm not a jimmy buffett fan but uh, we can include the door and you can walk right out and then i <laughs> I, I thought just... you were going to say the doors. I was like, yeah, I like the doors. Oh, no, no. This just means I have to leave. There it is. We'll play the, the doors music next to all the doors. So and Jimmy Buffet exit. music at the buffet. I see. Wait a minute. And then Fall Out Boy next to all the boys that attend. Oh, I was going to say next to when I fall over because I've probably had too much to drink. But yeah, I guess that too. There's no boys at this party. I I, I created it and they won't come. <laughs> Trust me, if I create it, they won't attend. I tried it many times in my ninth grade year. We'll make, we'll at least send out like a post on MySpace or something. People will see <laughs> it. God. See, telling you this coding is really, really useful. I think uh, Anonymous could probably use me and my my many skills. I found Patrick Stump's phone number. I mean, Did just you? saying. Remember, I found Patrick Stump's phone number and then I called, but he was on tour and so his aunt answered, but I knew her name. So I was like, Oh, yeah, this is I knew who she was. So anyway, it was really horrible. And I don't recommend stalking people uh, ever. So that was really bad. But I did it. I found out um, one of the Duggars phone numbers, which I will never, ever call. I just wanted I just like knowing I have it. I just <laughs> Yeah, there's like a power in it <laughs> in case trouble strikes. And I'm like, OK, well, time to call the Duggars. Obviously, they're going to fix all my crises. <laughs> I will say, too, that like, well, one day you will need that. You'll just be like, oh, my God, this I knew this moment was coming. When I realize I need Jesus. Yeah, yeah. you're right. <laughs> Yeah, I should call now, actually. Let me let me put him on speaker. Real, one last thing. Somebody, a couple of people messaged me because after I moved, everyone started trying to Google me and uh, they were like, oh my God, I found all your info. And for whatever reason, some random phone number and address are now listed as my new address. And it's like completely incorrect. So I'm like, sweet. Sure, that's me. And it's totally not. So um, if you're concerned on my behalf, I appreciate it. But I've already checked and um, my new info is not there yet. Uh, hopefully ever my information i have checked is also wrong on the internet so they just in case people are fucking stalkers please (laughs) first of all don't look although last time i said don't google pictures of me with long hair it fucking skyrocketed on google which i can see by the way i know you guys are brave behind your computers but i told you not to do it so now that you're gonna go do it the information is actually inaccurate so my favorite people is when people are like, I found all this info about you, but it was only because I was concerned. And I was like, uh-huh. So you were like, I'm, I'm going to Google sure. Christine's home address and phone number. because I'm really... <laughs> Anyway, it was very funny and I appreciate it. But I promise you, I don't even recognize the zip code. I was like, holy shit, somebody saved my butt. I don't know if they went in there and just like put fake shit in. But so try. You can try calling me. It's not going to work. You'll probably get <laughs> Patrick Stump's aunt or something. Perf- or, or the Duggars. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but also you do make a really good point. It's a shame people today, or at least, you know, the, the cool, trendy youngsters 
don't understand or appreciate what MySpace did for a generation. They taught all of us how to code. And like, yeah. it's such a shame because MySpace showed up and then all of a sudden people liked MySpace because it was kind of uniform. But at the same time, it was like... You mean Facebook? Facebook, yeah, sorry. But when you had MySpace, like you learned how to make your own backgrounds. You learned how to add music. You learned music. graphics. And like, mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember, but like you could literally like you would find pictures and like and fit them into your whole profile and like you could have like yeah, you could like shift the format of your entire page yeah you could change the font you could add like like little effects and the movies and shit yeah i mean gifts before gifts were a thing by the way i know people listening that are like 15 and younger like there was a day where gifts did not exist but myspace like taught us how to make them it was very weird so anyway back to back to the story so uh all these hackers are learning how to build these programs simply to prank people. And it's basically what they're actually doing is slowly building up this political community about how information should be treated once it exists and Amazing. who should have access to it and how it should be treated and how it should be used. So ultimately this hasn't happened yet, but this is the inception of, uh, anonymous and their belief their core belief system which is that you know they may be they're seeing all this cool stuff they're capable of making and one day the consensus will be that everyone should have access to that freedom or yeah. to the access the freedom to that info so there was one hacker named richard stallman who apparently wrote a lot of essays about software and he was a huge candidate for information being free to the public um, he wrote a lot of essays, which over time became very political. And so he's kind of known as one of the people to, um, I guess, be firm in that belief early on. And um, so then there were, since this hacking culture had showed up in engineering and computer science, there were all these like little groups that started forming, like little like local organizations that were like hacker groups and they would all try to play pranks on each other and shit. That's so fun. <laughs> but there were also there were also some that I guess were more serious and they were like, okay, we just found this like little unit of people and we all know how to code. Like let's start making some really cool shit. So there was uh, one group that was kind of, at least in this storyline, there was one group that was did like some security research Um, and they were kind of more serious into coding and like trying to find like, it was like security based stuff that they had started looking into. There was another group that was very goofy and, um, pranksters. And I guess in both of these groups, there were a few members that overlapped and were in both of them. So they knew about pranking and like being kind of goofy, but they were also like really getting serious into the security, um, (laughs) communication culture, by the way, the goofy group was called the cult of the dead cow okay was, and so that's a very college bo- college kid thing to come up with yes i love it a thousand percent <laughs> also it sounds like someone who would have performed at the headlining jimmy buffet work <laughs> oh my god <laughs> um, they were the opening act <laughs> <laughs> the cult of the dead cow um so members who were in cult of the dead cow and i think also in the more serious group called loft um they were writing code one day together and I think it was more security based. And this guy in Cult of the Dead Cow, he realized that what they were doing and what they were creating with this program is they were helping communicate securely in a way where in theory, the government couldn't even catch you doing it. Ooh. We're like, if, if you live in a country where the government is censoring or spying on your, yeah. on your, um, on your communication, this program would be able to alleviate that. Um, <clears throat> and so this, this is a quote from one of the people in loft, which was the more serious security group. His name is Chris. Uh, I don't know if he wants me to say his last name. His name was Chris. Um, Chris said, quote, the principle was freedom of expression. Everyone should have access to the internet and everyone should be able to communicate on the internet, even more important in countries that where there were oppressive regimes. So, this was kind of the first nugget of not only do we think people should have access to really cool information, but now in a kind of more of a political way, if you're being censored or if you're being told that you can't, it just makes us want to help you even more. Yeah. Wow. So that was where the term hacktivism came in, which is what anonymous is known as hacktivists. Um, And so this actually came out of the program that cult of the dead cow and loft were working on. So 
hacktivism became this culture where now people were trying to do digital protesting, which was the first of its kind. So there were virtual sit-ins, um, which are basically, I told you this was topical. Whoa. I know. I'm like, this is really on brand today. So um, virtual sit-ins are this thing called, and I'm going to ruin this for, I'm sure there's some like computer techies out there who are, I'm, they're going to rip their hair out when I explain this. Cause I'm kind of having a hard time with it, but basically it's called denial of service is this tactic that they use during virtual sit-ins. And so for the rest of the show, I'm going to call it a DOS or DDOS. There's another D in there before and I forgot what it was, but something denial of service or DDOS. It's called dope, a dope denial. Of <laughs> and uh, the essentially dead cow group came up with that one. The dead denial of service. Okay. So uh, basically it's when hackers all get together and they overload a website with traffic and it crashes. Yeah, that's been happening a lot this week too. Yes. We okay, sorry. Yeah, I know we're getting there. <laughs> no, you're good. So basically it keeps um, legitimate users from ac- accessing the site because it keeps crashing and is overwhelmed. Right. Um, and they even, so one of the early forms of this was there was an airline called Lufthansa. 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 And it's a German airline. Lufthansa. Okay. Well, apparently people didn't like them <laughs> because oh, well. they were using their planes to deport immigrants Oh, boy. And so hacktivists came out and found out about that. And so they used um, DDoS or denial of service to take down all the airline's flight communications. So the flight, the planes couldn't fly out. Whoa. <laughs> Holy shit. It only gets crazier. So, okay. By That's the way. Like legit stuff. By the way, the German courts ruled that that was a valid protest, a valid form of protest. Listen, at least Germans follow some rules. They they know when they can't be. <laughs> They're like, be. you got us. You yep. got us. <laughs> no loopholes. And like that was at the time when hacktivism came out, there were very specific groups that were doing hacktivism. Most of them were prank based. It was just like now that they knew what they could do, some people were using it for good, but not okay. most at this point. That being said, now coming up on like 9-11, um, internet usage is now being surveilled like it never Mm. has been and a lot of people in the hacker world were upset because now there's like there's not the freedom to move around anymore um in the way that they used to unless you had really good tech skills and you could work behind the system circumvent it exactly so this is where i'm gonna lose a lot of people but hang in there okay so a lot of people are about to get really mad i just should i just leave oh is this I thought you meant like, because I wasn't going to understand it, but you mean like opinion based. You're going to get offended. And me? by everyone. Like okay. if you listen to the show, you're about to get offended. And I'm sorry. And again, I'm reporting the news. And I can also tell you, I promise it gets better. So just hang in there. Okay. It's about oh, to get God. Okay. really. Okay. It's about to get really fucked up. And I'm sorry. So. Now that we know the history of hacker culture and where it all comes from and what their main beliefs are, um, let's talk about 4chan. Ay, Christ. Okay. A lot of people, if you don't know what 4chan is, it's um, kind of, it was literally quoted, by the way, <laughs> on this documentary as the most vile, disgusting thing on the internet. <laughs> so Yeah, that's pretty much sums it up. <laughs> it's just a place, let me just get into it. Okay, so... 4chan came out in 2015, not 2015, 2012, I think, 2011, 2012, 2011, I think. Um, or at least it, uh, oh, well, I'm looking at my own notes. This has to be in like the, the OOs still. So like 06 or 07 or something. So 4chan is basically a website where you can post anything. And that's mm-hmm. the most descriptive I can get. <laughs> <laughs> it's like. It's kind. Of, it looks like Reddit. It looks like kind of old school. Like it really hasn't been updated. Right. Um. But truly, the whole idea, especially at the time, like let's remember culturally, like today is a very different world, and we have a, we're a lot more PC. At the time, the internet had just become wildly accessible to a lot of teenagers, and there were no rules yet because a bunch of teenagers up until this point had never fucking oh. had computers. God. So it was a and. You know, being a teenager, one of the main points is a lot of shock value humor. So it became essentially this gold mine where people who were always trying to one up each other with, you know, graphic humor 
could post. And there was specifically a group called the B board. Um, and that apparently was just like the worst of the fucking worst. It was literally in the documentary referred to as the Lord of the flies oh, <laughs> because God. it's just, if whatever your brain can't even process as the most grotesque thing on earth has probably been posted there. Why? Why people? Whether it's memes or like really shocking graphic, horrible videos. What's wrong um, with people? Any, even like comments. I mean, a lot of like, you know, specifically, you know, homophobic, transphobic, racial, anything, anything that could offend anybody has been posted there in the worst way possible. Um, and a quote from the documentary is, it's what you get when people are allowed to express themselves with absolutely no restrictions whatsoever. And it was also enabled to get worse and worse because apparently the way that 4chan works, I have never used 4chan, but apparently the way that it was described to me through this doc is that if you don't keep a certain thread trending, apparently it wouldn't archive. So the only, let's say you put something in there that you thought was really funny or clever. There was, you wanted to keep that thread going. You had to keep it trending, mm -hmm. which means you needed attention grabbing things that people will look at on that thread. So it will stay active. Right. Okay. So it enabled people to put some really vile shit on there just so it would stay active. Because you, even if you offended someone on there, like at least now people are talking on it, right? Oh, God. So remember, at this point, I'm not defending that any of this is okay. I'm just saying that given <clears throat> the, the time period and the historical context to what 4chan was at the time, the point of internet culture at this moment in time is that you are allowed to post whatever you want. That was the whole point of it is like, look at all this freedom and power I have at my fingertips. Okay. So it kind of became this sick challenge to always one up people of like, look what I can do. Well, look what I can do. And like, look that I'm able to do it. And so uh, that is where we get trolling. <laughs> if someone, and this is again, uh, I don't know if this is a direct quote or at least this was, this is a paraphrase of what someone said on the show. If someone took the internet too seriously or was offended, trolls were going to try to upset you just to almost remind you at the, again, at the time it was almost like trolls had this responsibility to remind people of these hacker culture values of like, like remember where you are. This isn't going to fly here. Oh my God. And again, I don't condone this, but I'm trying to like, I'm trying to empathize with these other people so I can get through this story. So um, at their, their values are very much like you don't get to be offended because the whole point is that we can do it. And that's it. Like emotion. Uh, this is no strings attached. This is emotionless. Just look at the concept Ooh. that can be created. Okay. So obviously people with a little more sensitivity would get on there and be like, I can't fucking believe you'd post these things, but they would almost get a rise out of it. Sure. Of like, that's exactly how trolls work, right? How dare you show up on our platform where the whole point is that we can do it. And like, look, we're going to do it again. <laughs> and then be surprised that we're doing it. Yeah. So this is where the anonymous name shows up because originally, I don't know if this is like people could create their own accounts and like have a different username or everyone at one point couldn't do an, a username. But a majority of 4chan was that people would post and not, it was such graphic content. They probably didn't want to have their name attached to it. So everyone never put in a username. So everyone just said anonymous as, <gasps> oh. their, as their username because they hadn't put a name in. So see. it became this running joke on 4chan that like hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people a day are, con are putting content out there and it's all named anonymous. And there was this joke of like, maybe it's all the same person on a bunch of oh, different servers. Oh, that's funny. And it was kind of like, you know, no one's ever seen a person in real life put any content on 4chan. So like, it might as well be one identity, like yeah. anonymous. So um, anyway, being bred out of 4chan and then b board, which is like ultra 4chan and hacker culture of like, we can do whatever the fuck we want. And like, we have the freedom of speech and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Anonymous as a unit was originally started as you know, now they've got also got some trolls under their belt and they're like, we want to make a point that we can do whatever we want. They started doing things for cheap laughs just to prove that they could do things. Oh. And if it upset you, fuck you. Like the train group. 
the train group. Oh, I thought like the railroad club or whatever. Oh, kind of. It's quickly moved from like we're doing like happy pranks to like. Or the har- are they no longer harmless pranks? They're they're not as harmless anymore. So oh, no. okay, but it's but you're right though. It's like it still has the consistency of like its roots of like okay now we're pranking, but now right. we're pranking with the intent to get a rise out of you because you've shown you hate this. I see. Okay, and so. To remember this later, apparently they were doing it for laughs or at the time when LOL literally just came out, guys. The phrase LOL. <laughs> lots lots of love. Oh, okay. <laughs> they were doing it for lulz, but they were they were spelling it L-U-L-Z. Lulz. So the first time that this really got broadcasted, there was a Fox News segment where this guy, like a random person too, that's the path of it, is like you just want to fucking bother someone. And, like, just get <laughs> under someone's skin. So this random guy, his MySpace account kept getting hacked. And he would make, like, a different account. And it would get hacked. They'd make a different account. It'd get hacked. <laughs> but they were posting, like, photoshopped, I'm assuming photoshopped, um, graphic pictures of him with men <gasps> while he had a girlfriend. Oh, dear. And apparently this girlfriend broke up with him because she saw all these pictures on his MySpace that they had, they had locked him out of. So he had, he couldn't (gasps) fix it. So every time he changed the account, there'd be new graphic pictures of him with men and his girlfriend broke up with him. And again, not, uh, not at all condoning this, but thinking about the, the timeline here, this was a time in the world where it was hysterical to teenagers. If you were gay, fucking horrible. Right. It's the worst insult, quote unquote. The worst insult. So like this, like compared to today, if someone like, I mean, yeah, no one wants XXX pictures posted of them. But <laughs> if it was like gay or straight, who the fuck cares now? Well, and Back nowadays then, too, it was, like it's, oh, sorry. Oh, no, was, nowadays too, it's like illegal. Well, and all, it was definitely legal too. Yeah. But I was just gonna say also, it's so much easier to be like, that's photoshopped. Like, right. It's, right, it's exactly. like, it's so much easier for people to photoshop nowadays that it's like probably also easier to convince people that it's photoshopped. Exactly. So, and back then it was just a different world where being gay was apparently disgusting and worth laughs or lulls. And also photoshop wasn't like a good enough argument. So anyway, that was the first real segment of like, okay, someone's being fucked with for literally no reason. Yikes. And so it was basically insensitive pranks to anyone who they could get their grasp on. And it was um, for no reason except that they wanted to be disruptive, which I'm sure you could psychoanalyze into like maybe this was a culture of, you know, uh, you know, quote, computer nerds who like maybe liked feeling seen or feeling a sense of power over someone. So, right. I mean, it, you could really get into that. But Let's really piss people off. I want to make it clear now. I'm going to talk about it as um, as straightforward as possible. But I, I don't want you getting the wrong idea that I was not wildly offended when I first heard about this. So the first time that that happened and then segments started coming out where people were recognizing this group. It was almost giving them, again, an ego of like, oh, if you piss people off, now we're talking about it. And now you're just going to want to piss people off even more for the clout, maybe. Or So I don't know if that was necessarily their agenda, but you could definitely read into it that way. And so people started getting together and gathering through um, 4chan because at this point, people are starting to become friends because they're all hacking people for fun. Um, and so they decide to... I'll get together one day and infiltrate this website called Habo Hotel, which is basically, it was described to me as like a second life or Sims or some sort of. Oh, is it like a software? It's like a, it's like an online website that you can log into and. Like Club Penguin. Like Club Penguin. It actually (laughs) looked, it looked a lot like Club Penguin when I saw the the, the graphics. (laughs) I'm going to picture it as Club Penguin. It's probably going to ruin Club Penguin forever. Oh. It will ruin all penguins and clubs. No! <laughs> so um, apparently they were like, look at what we are capable of. Like, we're getting recognition. Like, let's really go piss people off now that, you know, we're known as people who will piss people off. And so they decided to go to Habo Hotel. Um, and they decided that they were going to infiltrate this account. And by uh, infiltrate, I mean, like, thousands of people on 4chan agreed that they were all going to make accounts. So thousands of accounts showed up on Habo Hotel. All of them made the exact same sim avatar. Yeah. 
So that way you couldn't tell who was who. It was just thousands of the same identical avatar. Oh my God. Who, by the way, I'm sorry, and I kind of hate that this is the story I'm covering given Uh-oh. what's Here been going go. on in the world. I'm really sorry. Um, this The avatar was a black man in a black suit. And um, so they, all these avatars join this world together. And I think originally the whole goal was like just to overwhelm, not necessarily the server so it would shut down, but just to freak people out on um, the, on the gaming or on the site, just so like people like literally couldn't walk through other avatars and like, it was almost like stopping their Ugh. enjoyment of the game. And then an idea came out on 4chan where they would take all of these thousands of people who happen to be black and ha- arrange them all, make them all walk in a way where it forms the swastika. Oh, for God's sake. So, and apparently, uh, I think uh, the whole point was truly not even politically to be disruptive. I think the whole point was to just kind of get in the way of people trying to play a game. Right. And then it, and then it escalated into that. And like, oh, wouldn't were, it be funny if wouldn't, wouldn't it, be it be funny shocking? if like while we're also in your way now there's also a swastika on like oh, Club how Penguin? How hilarious! <laughs> Club Penguin, no. And so, apparently, this is a, uh, another quote from one of the members. I think they might have been an actual member of this Abo Hotel kind of task, but or maybe they were just talking about the history of this in general, saying. The goal was actually to offend people because the idea that we could offend you by drawing a little shape on the screen was stupid to the people involved, which, by the way, is the most privileged fucking thing in the world. Because Totally. Even, I mean, it goes without saying, like, you clearly, one, have never been educated about this, or two, have been educated and are so entitled you don't give a shit yeah. and just throw yeah. you out the window. So I just want to make it clear that's wildly fucked up. I am, we're not trying to make light of well, that. Well, one of the favorite, like, signs I kept seeing at the protests were, uh, what does it say? Like, privilege it, privilege means thinking something's not a problem because it doesn't affect you. So, like, you're just like, what's the big deal? It's like, that's so backwards. Exactly. So, <clears throat> I wanted to address it, not necessarily because it's topical, but because, I don't know, I want to give a, a well-rounded understanding sure. of this well, it's group. it's worth knowing the history of it, Yeah. Also, if someone like watches the documentary after I covered this and realize I didn't mention <laughs> yeah, that I didn't, didn't. look like I was like fucking Leaving hiding it out. Anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so if you haven't gauged like your uh, like your what you imagine this group of people are, it's probably just on that instance alone, probably a lot of white men, a lot of straight white men on that yeah. website. <laughs> um, but so there was I don't want to say like there was a good thing about that because there wasn't, but there was a, a cultural significance in hacktivism because of this, because they were able to see all of us organized something and we were able to do something with our numbers. And mm. granted it was in a way that was disruptive and wildly fucked up. Yeah. But look that we are capable of doing something. Yeah. Um, and so at that point, uh, the friendships in 4chan are starting to get bigger and anonymous is actually kind of growing the sense of community and mm. they're recognizing what their power can do. And, um, uh, it kind of moves from, Hey, let's all agree to start an account over here and then piss people off. It starts kind of moving into, you know, let's just be friends. <laughs> How sweet. <laughs> Quick fucking change. And like that, that doesn't that's not like a sweeping generalization there's still a lot of people on 4chan even to this day like 10 years later where their whole goal is to piss people off like trolling is still a massive thing but there were some people as we know very well by the way as we know we are <laughs> we are familiar with that um but there's a uh, but in this moment some people re- recognized what they were capable of doing in in their power of numbers and uh totally accidentally Ended up doing something good. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> which is the best way to do something good, I guess. Um, so 2007 hits. And I don't know if you remember Hal Turner or if that name sounds familiar. Um, he, so he was a radio host. He was also a fucking Nazi. 
Um, and he like literally was a Holocaust denier. He thought that we should what the he fuck? thought we should still have slaves. Apparently, okay, like sure. really a horrible, horrible, horrible fucking man. And he of all people just happened to harass one of the people on 4chan. I don't know if they were like butting heads on something i don't i don't know how they came to- i mean it seems like he was bound to accidentally piss someone off on the internet so it makes sense one of them was bound to a 4chan person or hal turner so uh but so i don't know how they knew each other or what the argument was but apparently they had some issues and hal turner started trying to harass this guy oh, shit. and now that anonymous or 4chan is like um kind of building up this community and they all happen to be hackers they were like, well, we're going to defend our friend who's like getting harassed by this fucking Nazi. So we'll put a giant swastika on his screen right. and it'll that'll show him. <laughs> it's like, So, yeah, exactly. So it's like this weird out of nowhere good thing that happened. <laughs> yeah. And it's this perfect. There's a really nice quote from one of the people who actually was involved. And he had I think his face was covered or some people like did have identities hidden. Um, but this guy had a quote saying. I guess we figured we had the the moral high ground, which allowed us to get more people on our side, at least like, you know, online wise. Sure. But he was also a fucking neo-Nazi and you're not allowed to do that. And there's a million neo-Nazis out there, but he started picking on our dude. And so we had to go to our dude's fucking defense and it just so happened he was also a Nazi. <laughs> and so like, they were like, wow, we were going to okay. defend our friend no matter what. Like, if it was Mother Teresa, we were going to defend our friend. Sure. This guy just okay. happened to be a Nazi, and it worked out for us. And so yes, they all start trolling the fuck out of this guy. And so Uh-oh. to a point where they are mass calling him, mass emailing him, mass messaging him. They're harassing him on the air. But apparently, because <gasps> he's a Nazi, and because he... Uh, was like used to having to defend his beliefs. He was not being intimidated by this group of people. Oh, sure. Which was a new challenge for them because they were used to people being offended like that. And so sure. now all of a sudden someone is like fighting back and things start ramping up. So uh, they overloaded his website, which apparently, according to the documentary, cost him a lot of bandwidth fees. Then they signed him up for escorts um, on Craigslist. <laughs> Oh a bunch of people sent him like countless pizzas and also construction materials that he ended up having to pay delivery fees on. They were just kind of wiping him clean financially, however they could, however they could. So this ended up, it got to a point, there were so many people involved in this that literally Hal Turner didn't have enough money to pay for his radio show anymore. So they shut him down. Oh, shit. They literally got him off the they, air. At least temporarily, they got him off the air. Oh and, God. um, so more and more people were like, oh, like there's like a reason to be hacking and trolling someone and people are like in- encouraging this. Fuck yeah, we're going to do it. So sure. more uh, experienced hackers start also hacking into his private servers and they found emails that saw that although he was a neo-Nazi, he was also an informant for the FBI. And they also found out what they also found out that he had been threatening to kill judges Um what the fuck and so then 4chan leaked this info and when this happened it came out as like hackers online in this 4chan group um they you know helped us find a nazi whatever and so even though like by the way he was saying like obviously nationalist shit on his radio show but right, they were like right. they took him down and he's like a, he's a great there look at all these great activists and so genuine activists now started joining 4chan thinking they were gonna like fight the nazis so um so more people started joining 4chan and anonymous thinking they were joining a legit activism organization oh boy (laughs) so there was a lot of original people in 4chan who are like there's like now this budding of beliefs because now they're almost not necessarily outnumbered, but there's definitely a large group of them now who don't want to be insular and cause chaos it's like yeah again as the there was a quote earlier that they called themselves internet's first army and not that they ever said that out loud but it was just kind of an understanding that this is what it was turning into and then in 2008 hits and they call it operation chenology they have a lot of operations which we're going to get to but (laughs) okay uh, operation chenology basically now there's millions of people in anonymous at this point in 2008 
Um, and this private video of Tom Cruise comes out talking about Scientology and he looks fucking batshit crazy. And so the video goes viral. Um, and so website, websites start posting the video everywhere for clickbait and Scientology starts sending all these ceases and cease and desists. Oh man. And anonymous, although they are changing in some ways, they still have their core values of do not censor us. We have the freedom to information. Do not fuck with us. And so they found out that like you know scientology is telling us what we can and can't do on our internet like in our culture on our in our territory yeah so they started posting the video to like and by they i mean like again thousands and thousands all at one time are posting it on every website they can find just so scientology can't take them down fast enough (laughs) okay and then at one point Uh, the website Gawker even like wrote an article saying like, this is newsworthy. Even if Scientology comes at us with a cease and desist, we're not going to take it down. Whoa. Okay. And so uh, there was one woman on the show or on the documentary who had an excellent point. I wish I wrote her name down, but so she said, and I'm going to quote her. She said, Scientology is an interesting target for anonymous because in some ways it's the perfect inversion of what geek and hacker culture or what, what geeks and hackers value science and i'm paraphrasing here but science fiction inter, uh, intellectual property freedom they're very closed off from the rest of society um and then she goes back to saying if you had something like a cultural inversion machine and you stuck in geeks and hackers you would probably get something that looks a lot like Scientology. So there's a real pleasure in attacking your perfect nemesis. Whoa. I thought that was such a powerful quote. It's like such a goose camp moment. And then a, a member of Anonymous added on saying, quote, we're such polar opposites with them being secretive and us hating secrets. And most most importantly, how fucking self-important they thought they were. They thought they were untouchable. And so Anonymous was like, you better fucking watch out. And so... They also found out about Scientology's fair game policy, which if anyone knows, the second that someone says anything against Scientology as a member or decides to leave Scientology, they will ruin that person's fucking career, their lives, their relationships, whatever they can. So it scares people into staying in Scientology. Sure. Anonymous knew about that. And they're like, so you're censoring people and messing with their freedom, which is going exactly against what we believe. Yeah. And so basically they were ready to fucking throw down and my favorite quote in the entire documentary was the same guy from earlier who said he says everyone knew who anonymous was and uh and what they were capable of and people thought anonymous and scientology are gonna fight this is gonna be weird and amazing (laughs) (laughs) but like truly and uh it sounds like a sci-fi book so anyway so hackers then started coming all over the world. People who weren't even in Anonymous, who weren't really part of 4chan, they just heard that like they were about to like duke it out with Scientology and everyone, Avengers Endgame style, fucking was ready to go. And so they started ordering pizzas again. They started clogging the phone line so that scientists actually couldn't, or Scientologists couldn't get to the, their, uh, to the company. Uh, my favorite thing they did, they found out every fax number in Scientology across the world and faxed hundreds of pieces, Stop. faxed hundreds of pieces of black paper so all of their ink would run out. Oh, that's brilliant. So, again, hackers are reaching out out of everywhere being like, how do we help? And this is when they create their own DOS system, their own uh, system where they can overwhelm a site and shut it down. Sure. And they call it the low orbit ion cannon because that was apparently like the end all be all weapon in one of the video games that they all played. So (laughs) so they called it the or loik, a low orbit ion cannon. And it was their own version of like overwhelming a computer. And so one guy named Brian, he either built it or just used it during the Scientology thing. He ended up getting arrested later um oh shit but anyway during this this was the first time that um anonymous ended up making videos and uh because they also just recently put one out um with everything going on but this was the first time they put out an anonymous video and it was called declaration of war and it was the first time that anonymous actually called itself anonymous um oh they also had a second video called call to arms excuse me where they basically told everybody like we're going to protest the Church of Scientology. And the quote literally was, be very wary of the 10th of February. And uh, 
Ew. <laughs> Anonymous invites you to join us in an act of solidarity and then basically take up the banner of free speech, of human rights, of family, and freedom. And then they had a third video called Code of Conduct where they were like, we know what sociology or, or what Scientology is about. Like they are going to try to ruin our fucking lives if they know who we are. So we have to go covered up. Like we cannot let people know what our identity is. Jeez. So that's where the Guy Fawkes mask, the F- Guy Fox I masks see. come in, which also was on brand for them because they were called anonymous. But like, yeah, the whole point wasn't even because they're anonymous. It was because they were afraid of Scientologists, like finding out who they are and ruining them afterwards. <clears throat> so they chose the Guy Fox masks, by the way, because of the end of the movie for V Fen- V for Vendetta. Oh, yeah. They literally just apparently that's how anonymous people saw each other. So they were like, all right, let's do that. So that's fun. Uh, apparently 10,000 people, more than 10,000 people across the world protested, which was like, they wow. didn't even know. Cause it was funny in the documentary, they were like, these are a bunch of like computer geeks in their basement, like who are introverts and don't leave their house. Like what if like 10 people show up and we look like assholes to Scientology and 10,000 people showed up. Wow. So at this time, a lot of original anonymous people or a lot of original 4chan people are pissed because now this is clearly an activism organization in their eyes so they're now doing things to piss off their own anonymous counterparts that are doing good so they're like now hacking into while all the good anonymous stuff is happening original 4chan people are now pissing people off and trolling websites and calling themselves anonymous to give them a bad rep so for example they went on they hacked a bunch of epilepsy or ep- oh uh, epilepsy medicine or medical sites and put strobing lights as the backgrounds <gasps> so that people would get fucking seizures the fuck and then they were calling it like anonymous did it so like i'll see okay so they were trying to do all these things but like don't let that don't worry about that because anonymous ended up staying strong so they the next <laughs> operation they had was operation tit storm which is a real thing Oh, dear. And apparently that was because uh, the Australian government was censoring porn specifically towards people with small breasts. I don't understand. I don't know if I heard that fucking right, but it's in the documentary. Um, That's beautiful, Em. Thank you. It's some sort of porn censorship. But apparently censorship is censorship no matter what it is. And so Anonymous went after uh, all of their government websites. And it's the first time Anonymous went after a government oh at different times they also uh hacked the and they did that with dos attacks against they shut down the site so nobody could get to the government site um they did the same thing for the motion picture association the uh, recording industry association um because they were uh they were signing something or they were taking down file sharing programs which was censoring the internet um they also they also thought it was hypocritical by the way that they um Apparently, the Motion Picture Association hired a software to DOS a bunch of file sharing programs to like try to shut them down on their own. And uh, um, Anonymous was like, "That's hypocritical because a lot of our people got arrested doing that for the Scientology oh, sure. shit. So like, why do you get to do it?" And then the next big thing that happened was Operation Payback. I am almost done i promise no no this is just beyond fast i knew none of this <laughs> thank you I, pre- I did a lot of work so i know <clears throat> so the next big thing we're in 2010 and this is called operation payback so operation <gasps> payback happens with um the website wikileaks oh which, shit which anonymous is for because it's literally like leaking pub like whistleblower information and like yeah uh shit that like the government probably doesn't want you to know about so actually the WikiLeaks founder was also a hacker. So he immediately believed that, you know, f- the freedom of information and all that. So he at one point apparently released half a million United States secret files on the Iraq war, <gasps> um, which apparently was called cable gate, which I don't remember, but it was the largest leak of classified U S files in history. Damn. Um, and so, It also leaked that our government was surveilling its allies. Right. Um, So apparently what happened next, because I guess the way that WikiLeaks worked was people would donate. That's how it it stayed funded. Mm -hmm. In protest to what WikiLeaks had revealed about the government, 
PayPal, MasterCard, and Amazon all ended their relationships with WikiLeaks, which halted any donations being able to go to the site, essentially killing the site. Boo. So Anonymous got pissed off because they were like, so these three companies care more about the banks and they care about people knowing about our information about what's happening in the world. And so they got pissed off at PayPal and MasterCard, specifically MasterCard and PayPal, not so much Amazon at the time. I don't think Amazon was nearly as big as it is today. (laughs) Amazon was like, I promise we're selling books, but someday we'll be huge. One day you'll see. Um, (laughs) But so they pretty much went after any credit card company um, and saw that they were still selling merch on KKK websites and Westboro (gasps) Baptist Church websites. I see. And so they were like, oh, so like you have no problem funding anyone with a fucked up ideology until the, they're telling us what the government's doing behind our back. So then, at basically, the understanding was that these companies had shut themselves away or ended their relationship with WikiLeaks because the government got exposed and they shut off access to the website by having credit card companies walk away. And so right. Anonymous then disabled the credit card websites. Like, <gasps> like went after MasterCard and Visa and PayPal. Sure. And apparently, like, like bank of america they shut down bank of america or oh, some like a massive bank and so basically that was its own whole fucking thing which ended up later coming back in the news and a lot of people ends up getting arrested for being a part of that um the government also uh so i get these two confused um because there was they happened right near each other where they helped out tunisia the country and egypt um they helped out both of those because both of those countries were being heavily censored by the government with their internet use. And uh, I'm going to kind of combine them as one story, even though eh, I'm going to try my best, actually. I want to do them both justice. But I guess there was like volunteer activists in the Middle East who were helping run internet. And some of them happened to be part of Anonymous. And since they were hackers, they had really good access to like back end of sites and stuff. So they right. were able to tell their hackers in america or anonymous in america like hey this is like some of the shit that the government's hiding and like i don't think the country knows about this and um so they ended up uh like breaking into government sites sending documents about what the government was doing and forwarding them to the u.s anonymous and so from there the u.s anonymous had gotten already they'd gotten wikileaks back up and they started posting all this shit on wikileaks about what other governments were doing um censoring their internet use from their people um and then somehow they also helped tunisia access this information so they found out what was going on and they saw what the government was doing to them and so they uh made a guide for the people so that they could hide what they were doing on the internet from the government like taught them how to Mm -hmm. hack pretty much and then shared um so then people there were also like they were like, I want to talk about what's going on in the world, but we're censored. Like I could never tell anyone like what's going on over here. So then anonymous helped get that information from them and then tweet about it in America. So we would know what was going on. Oh my God. And then uh, they also used DOS attacks on government servers to shut them down. Also hacked the prime minister, which left a message about anonymous saying that's what they did. Mm-hmm. And then the same thing happened um, leading up to the Egyptian revolution and Egyptians couldn't access, uh, couldn't access websites. Um, and so anonymous took reports from Egyptians, tweeted them out on behalf of them to help get the word out. And then uh, the hackers that were volunteering over in the area and anonymous came together to set up live feeds so people could see the protests that were going on in real time. Again, very topical protesters were getting hurt and killed by the government and basically when the Egyptian government found out that people could see this live feed of what was going on, they literally shut down the internet point blank <gasps> period. Like just shut down the fucking internet. They were like, we don't even want, no one's going to see what's going on. Oh, oh. So then because they were talking to fucking hackers with clout, they knew how to work around third party sites. And so they turned the internet back on <laughs> <laughs> they turned on Egypt's internet and then they started. Oh my God. This is insane. They worked with the activist. I'm probably fucking up parts of this. If I'm wrong, please like let me know and I'll correct myself. But 
uh, he, they also started working with the hackers that were over in Egypt to make sure that information was getting sent back and forth properly. Oh. And then, and what they were sending was they were like these guides on how the the people themselves could turn on third party sites to keep the internet back on in case it shut down again. They were also live tweeting mass dial up connection info, including usernames and passwords for different modems in the area <gasps> so that people could sign on and they wow. could be shown the government censored sites that anonymous was also posting for them to see. Oh my God. And then they tweeted out medical information for protesters. They found Arabic translators. And then they also attacked the government sites so that they couldn't come back on while the, while the people were using the <gasps> internet. So they like, to, like took over. And they took over. So the government couldn't see anything that was going on, oh, but all wow. the people had entire access. And wow. then they also sent a tweet. They posted a tweet saying, welcome back to the internet, Egypt. Well, <gasps> except for government website, you stay down. <laughs> and then they Holy kept it down. Holy hell. And ultimately, the president also stepped down soon after that. So, Whoa. Okay. Wow. So they're wow, changing wow, wow. fucking lives over here. So then uh, the Financial Times came out with an article um, a little bit after that saying that the CEO of this intelligence contract company, our contractor company, his name was Aaron Barr. He was the CEO of this uh, intelligence contractor called H.B. Gary. Aaron Barr apparently wrote to the Financial Times saying that he had infiltrated Anonymous and knew the members and was going to expose uh -huh. them. He literally told hackers, I will expose you. I just want <laughs> you so to hear stupid. that. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you exactly what they did. I'm just going to read the quote that was literally on the Stephen Colbert show. Okay, great. So Stephen Colbert said, Oh, I love him. If Anonymous is a hornet's nest, Aaron Barr said, I'm going to stick my penis in that. <laughs> Faster than you can say, get these hornets off my penis. Anonymous took down Barr's website, stole his emails, deleted his company's backup d data, trashed <gasps> his Twitter account, and remotely wiped his iPad. They're like, and the iPad for good measure. <laughs> exactly. They We're going to also... ruin your Candy Crush score. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they also hacked a hundred thousand or somewhere near that of his emails or his data or something holy hell and they found a powerpoint there called the wikileaks threat where um aaron bard literally planned to leak fake documents uh no. to to make wikileaks look bad presumably like wikileaks would have then uploaded it they would have looked discredited <gasps> and aaron bar would have what done his job dickhead so then they were pissed that he was like you know so then they exposed that about him. They were like, oh, so he's also trying to block our freedom of information. He ended up having to step down after all the shit they released on him. Whoa. And then soon after that, they were also after Sony, like the company Sony. Oh, boy. So then they were DOSing Sony because apparently Sony was suing people for hacking their PlayStations. Like, apparently oh. PlayStation had a feature on it for a while that Sony then took away, but people were like, we paid for that feature. We're going to hack our consoles to get oh, it back. Oh, I feel, I feel like I vaguely remember this because my brother was definitely in, like... A member of that? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is my WikiLeak. Uh, no. <laughs> I just remember him telling me about it or at least being, like, on the periphery watching it. Well, so apparently that happened and... Uh, Anonymous was like, okay, so you're telling us we can't do what we want with things we legally purchased. Like and, paid for, yeah. And then you took away. So then they started hacking um, Sony. But soon someone actually literally, some hacker in Anonymous actually broke into the PlayStation website and stole somewhere between 80 to 100 million people's login information, <gasps> home addresses, and credit card information. That's, I think I remember that. Holy hell. And apparently Sony and PlayStation had so much, like, crisis, crisis, I don't know what the right word is, crisis management. Some, yeah. They had to clean up the fucking mess. And so it ended up halting people from being able to even use their consoles for two months. Oh, shit. And it apparently did $150 million worth of damage. Oh my god. At the same time as this, it's 2011 and there's a random group that shows up from Anonymous called Lulz Security or Lulz <laughs> Sec. Jesus. And this group apparently are some original 4chaners who were like, okay, we're fucking done with Anonymous being all holier than thou. Lulz Sec is here and our whole job is to like do things for the sake of trolling. But at Anonymous level. So they started 
leaking strangers ATM information for no reason. Oh. They hacked uh, the PBS website because they didn't like a documentary on there and changed it out for a story about Tupac. They, oh. uh, which apparently Anonymous was against because they were censoring the press. So, Oh, true. Um, they also hacked the database for X Factor. They also... Oh, like uh, the show? Like the show. Oh, okay. They also... Uh, more bank account information they leaked. They DOS the CIA for three hours. Um, <gasps> they DOS the United Kingdom's serious organized crime website. Oh dear. Okay. They also released 26,000 emails and passwords for porn accounts as mm. well as Senate.gov. Uh, they had an event called Titanic Takedown Tuesday where they took down Minecraft by request. Um, they also took down the Bank of Portugal, the Assembly of the Republic, and uh, the Ministry of Economy, Innovation, and Development. They also DOS sites for um, the government of Brazil, the president of Brazil, and then they leaked a bunch of police officers' addresses, numbers, passwords, and social security numbers, and the British paper, The Sun. What the So F? they also, which is arguably the worst thing, Packed and leaked over 100,000 login information for military accounts through a defense contractor and 30,000 credit card numbers from an, intellig- uh, an intelligence uh, company. And they leaked all that to WikiLeaks. Holy shit. So after 50 days of this, apparently it was called the 50 days of lulls. And <clears throat> it had, it was like their celebration. And after 50 days, they said that they had, quote, achieved their mission to disrupt organizations and then disbanded and then were all arrested. Um, oh, I was going to say, yeah, can't get away with that forever. People who were also arrested, um, uh, who are mentioned in the documentary, at least, were the 16 people called the Anonymous 16 who were arrested during Operation Payback, which was PayPal, MasterCard, WikiLeaks sure. thing. And their argument or what they're going to what they were going to fight in court was saying that DOS attacks should be a valid form of virtual protesting. Um, and then one of the members who at the time was a 19 year old girl. So definitely not the stereotype of a hacker. Um, she was one of the people arrested and about operation payback. She said, quote, they scared the shit out of the pop. Pow- uh, they as an anonymous, they scared the shit out of the powers that be, and that's why this is being investigated. That's why I'm under indictment, because 10,000 angry people proved to the government that their regulations, their ideas, their views of PayPal, their view of WikiLeaks, their view of the Afghan war in Egypt and Tunisia and Bolivia didn't fucking matter. Their opinion no longer mattered because someone out there on the internet was kicking ass. <sighs> and uh, NS- the NSA has called Anonymous a potential national security threat. Um, saying that they could disable parts of the U.S. power grid. Time Magazine called them the most influential people and one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2012. And um, really quickly, I do want to uh, say, I know I've been talking for fucking ever, but I do want to talk about what's going on in the world right now. Yes, yes. It's very necessary. I'm going to text plays to bring me a beer. I'm like living in dreams right now. Well, I'll also say that um, I had a list. I might actually just, I have another list, which I won't really get super into. But at one point, Anonymous and LulzSec actually collaborated to leak a bunch of police information and credit card information and then made a bunch of donations on their credit cards from the police. Oh. Um, so it was kind of like, oh, we're going to do something bad. But That's also very like good. Robin Hood. That's like a very Robin Hood move. <laughs> exactly. They also have been a part of um a lot of black lives matter Mm -hmm. um they had individual operations from ferguson to um back in i think 2012 um two cops shot charles hill in san francisco Mm -hmm. uh, and they were cops from bart the bart team or the bart system and so they ended up leaking customer info there um uh let me see for ferguson they did things when it came to Michael Brown and Tamir Rice. And they promised that if any of the protesters were harassed or harmed, they were going to attack the city's servers and computers and take them offline. Both times they had to. And they also (sighs) hacked into the KKK servers and released personal details of members. That one I remember. Yeah. Um, 
They also that is crazy. There are multiple times where they have had different operations where they hacked into um, child pornography sites on the dark web <gasps> and leaked like thousands and thousands of usernames and also disabled right. a bunch of image swapping websites. Thank God. Um, they posted, a, they not only leaked the names, but also the emails and IP addresses of suspected pedophiles. They posted that on wow. Twitter. Um, but they also, there was my personal favorite in that it was like wildly mm. fucked up is Operation Hunt Hunter, where there was a guy named Hunter Moore who had a revenge porn site called Is Anyone Up? <sighs> And oh. literally people would just send their exes naked pictures to oh, him. No. And I guess it had already, it was about to be taken down, but people asked anonymous for help. And so they anonymous crashed his servers, leaked his birthday, his address, his phone number, his parents' names, his social media information, his social media um, login information, his OK Cupid profile and his IP address. <laughs> His OK Cupid bro, what a piece of shit. And apparently what was really scary about it is he planned to revamp the site to make it even more dangerous for girls. Really, anyone, anyone can be a victim. I shouldn't have said girls, but primarily women were on this website. Um, he planned to revamp it by making it even more stalker friendly by having a field for the, uh, like having a field that you could type in. Hi, boys. Sorry. Um, I'm listening. Um, I just want to get my beer. No, you're good. I Like, I want to hear about this this with a nice cold beer to, for my revenge. He basically, uh, um, oh, he was going to make it more stalker friendly by next to every person's picture was going to leave a field so people could find out their address. Stalker friendly. What a great fucking word. And he was going to post pictures of maps to their house. So but any, like how psychotic like so why? anyone could see the picture that they like of someone who doesn't even know without their consent that picture exists and also here's their address and how to get there you can drive there i'm glad they released his parents names too because i'm sure they're fucking disappointed in him and you would think anonymous would have kicked this guy's ass unfortunately the only way that they were able that this got shut down was he ended up selling the website to an anti-bullying website, which now redirects the link to um, all the information about his lawsuits and like oh. offers you to join on the class action against him. Oh, that's good at least. Him. Um, but so anyway, now getting more into this current stuff um, back in 2016, I think um, it started all over again uh, with anonymous revealing over 350 alleged members of the KKK along with their links to social media. Um, and sadly, a lot of the people it's like, it's not even impressive that they found 350 people because a lot of those people they leaked about already had that they were members of the KKK and their bios. Oh, they weren't hiding it. Like they were proud to be members. Fucking a, but some of the people on the list, implied that there was FBI infiltration and they even wrote as the header of this list, they wrote the KKK are heavily infiltrated by the FBI. And apparently there were allegedly Whoa. three informants um, that they found on there. Like also, that one motherfucker that, um, yeah. Wasn't like, he an FBI informant? Yeah. 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 Uh, he was far up on these notes, but after that in 2017, they again hacked a child porn, uh, space in the dark web but apparently they knocked off 20 percent of the dark web in that one hack whoa um and so they took down over 10,600 different child pornography websites or at least 50 percent were porn 50 percent were sc scam sites but they left the calling card on every single website if you were to look at it saying we do not forgive we do not forget you should have expected us <gasps> and then they were pretty quiet until 2020 uh-huh and currently three different things have come out one was may 28th may 28th the thing that i tweeted was anonymous released a video to the minneapolis police department seeking revenge on them saying that they will expose their crimes to the world and i think my exact tweet was like do you know how fucking wild this has to be for anonymous to come out of the woodwork yeah three days later some they also uh released three days later um, they released documents incriminating uh, Trump and Epstein in multiple cases of pedophilia, rape, and sexual assault, 
Although I have heard arguments that apparently that was information that was already public. They were just yeah, I read that republishing too. it. Yeah. Um, apparently they're still useful, but still useful. I mean, still yeah. something people should not forget about in the midst exactly. of what's going on. Um, and then they also apparently have alluded to evidence of Princess Diana definitely being murdered by the British <gasps> family because oh, she shit. knew of their involvement in the sex trafficking ring. Oh, shit. And there were some other wild accusations. Those were the two big ones. And then the tweets disappeared the same day, but thanks to screenshotting, they're still circulating. Sure. And then only four days ago, apparently they shut down the Buffalo, New York website. And then okay. it came back up and they took it down again. Do we know why Buffalo, New York, or just like because? I'm not really sure why. Okay, interesting. Anyway, that's currently the update. I'm sh- If Anonymous comes out and exposes crimes to the world, we'll know about it, so... Wow. So, okay. What I've been following too is like my little sister, like the gen, speaking of Gen Zers, are obsessed with Anonymous. Have you like seen this whole trend? Are they obsessed with it because like as of a week ago when it just came out or? Yes. Oh, okay. I was like, unless they like knew about this from some. No, I don't think so. I think it's like a new thing. But my sister was like, oh yeah, you know, the Anonymous edits. And I was like, the what? She's like, the Anonymous edits. And I was like, I literally don't know what these, what you're saying to me right now. And she was like, oh, you know, like Gen Zers are creating all these anonymous edits and then Anonymous is sharing them. And it's like pictures of Anonymous, like the mask, and then like all these hearts around it. Oh, and shit. no. I have, have not you heard... seen that picture. Not at all. So it's like has all these like little like boco, whatever, bokeh hearts, <laughs> or whatever they're called, around around his face. And it's like basically turning him into, I think like, a, I don't know, I could be wrong, but kind of like a romantic icon. Like, oh, yeah, Anonymous. <laughs> and he has like hearts all around him. And my sister's like, oh, yeah, that's Gen Z. We just like to make anonymous edits. And I was like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. You know what? As long as you're making edits about someone that's, like, on our side right now. And, like, to be fair, to remind everyone, like, I'm not – we're not forgetting the fact that, like, it did stem from something that – The roots of it. The roots of it are pretty wild. And there's definitely, arguably, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of trolls out there who still love the original uh, purpose of fortune. But – anonymous seems to whether or not they actually like no matter what their belief is for all we know like they could be totally against certain social things but their one core value is do not fuck with people's freedom so wow anyway that's where they stand and that's very relevant today so here we are very relevant for today and also very against oppressive government so this is kind of the the perfect uh, disaster zone for them Truly. And I mean, it is kind of powerful. Like, I know you tweeted it too, but like the witches came out, the yeah. Amish came out, <laughs> Anonymous came out. It's like people are just uniting now suddenly. Um, it's just wild out there. Uh, yeah. And I've seen a lot of people like apparently have been pretending to be part of Anonymous and like leaking stuff, but it's not like legit. Well, so one of the one of those, uh, the last one I mentioned about the KKK and 350 people, apparently that one was called Operation Hoods Off. Oh, interesting. Okay. Apparently, they threatened to expose a bunch of information, and then some random person claiming to be anonymous just posted a bunch of random people's information. Oh, that's... Yeah. And then they had to be like, no, that wasn't us. And then later, they posted information being like, okay, this one's us. And it just kind of like weirdly discredited them a little bit. Like convolutes it, yeah. And also, like, there's... There is something to be said for you know as much good as they're doing they have gotten a lot of pushback from authority which like i'm sure is exactly what they want but authority does have a good point and that like yeah they knocked out like 20 percent of child porn rings or at least their websites or their servers but then people who were actually investigating those crimes all of a sudden trying to find the right like all of a sudden it was harder to find them or like they those servers were going to become more secure all of a sudden and they were like damaging cases that were open i see okay that's interesting or even if you're accusing someone of being in the kkk like you better be fucking right or else everyone looks bad like oh you, totally you could literally just be saying a random person is a supremacist and like they're not you know so like you have to like take everything kind of with a grain of salt because as although they have this massive power and reputation behind them and like yeah. i would like to think they're not just gonna like randomly say that someone's in the kkk right you don't know you know yeah you don't know if there are other people like just fucking around trying to mess with them I mean, or... trolls right like if you're yeah, tr- exactly if you're a hacker <laughs> troll you could literally just fucking decide to label someone like that and then their reputation's ruined so 
I like to think that they're doing all their stuff for good, but there is the argument that like you don't know really what's true and what's not sure, without sure. true hard documents, which that you don't always get. So, yeah. Oh my god, it's so wildly fascinating. I I knew none of. I only knew kind of like vaguely from when we were in like that high school college age when some of that stuff happened, but. I don't know why I had not followed it that thoroughly and I didn't know any of the history. So, I mean, I literally spoke for 45 minutes and I'm so fucking sorry, but. Oh my God. No. What are you talking about? You always say that. I love it. It's because trolls out there have said that I, I, uh, monopolize the conversation. People, you, M does not monopolize the conversation. I never, li- I literally never stopped talking. And so when M's telling a story, I just want to sit back and listen to the goddamn story. And if my stories are short, that's not M's fault. It's my fault. So please stop yelling at M about it. I know. I mean, thank you, first of all, for responding me. But also, no matter what, I wouldn't win because a lot of people say either I monopolize the conversation because my research is too thorough or people say like that I don't do right. enough research. So it's like, OK, well, I can't win. Here's fucking anonymous. Here's enough. This is why M, I keep telling M to stay off of Reddit, please, because uh, <laughs> M's the trolls get to get through oh, on Reddit and hurts. I can't handle trolls. So I just delete that. I can't even I deleted my Reddit account. Because I would inevitably end up like reading shit about us, and it's uh, it's mostly good. So thank you for that. But there's definitely some harsh ones. Like even moving, there was this whole drama, which I don't even want to get into. But people were like, "This is the end of the podcast. If Christine ever gets pregnant, like the show is over." And I was like, "Okay, if you don't name the baby after me, they're right." <laughs> okay, fair. <laughs> but then I was like, "Okay, this is coming from a person who's claiming to be like extremely progressive and whatever." And I'm like. So you're literally saying, oh, the second you have a child, you can't like do your job anymore, which is just so backwards. And so then all these people came, thank God, to my defense. It was very kind. And then they apologized later. So it was fine. But I just like this is why I avoid it because I'm like, I can't handle it. My psyche is too weak and fragile. (laughs) Uh, One person, it was like some random website that does ratings. I don't know why I was on it. No, I don't know what was wrong with me, but someone said that like I had completely plagiarized Jeff the Talking Mongoose because what they gave us a one star review because I had plagiarized Jeff the Talking Mongoose and their only evidence was because I guess last podcast on the left has recently covered it. And so they thought that like they said like Jeff the Talking Mongoose is such an obscure topic no, it's not there's no way that you would have never found it and i was like buddy i've been doing this for three years like maybe also, I- m doesn't even listen to podcasts so like do your research dude also like i literally like am just good at my fucking job i know we make a lot of fun of each other of like oh like we don't know what we're doing but like there's a reason this has worked for three years i know how to research <laughs> yeah and like i feel like some people think we've like quote unquote strayed from our like incompetent roots but like even at the beginning like we really worked our asses off to try and make this because we only, not to be, you know, braggy, whatever, like, just because we want to make sure our stories are correct and we don't want to, like, misrepresent anybody. And if I'm doing crime, like, I don't want to misrepresent anything. So I've always been very cautious of that. And I feel like that hasn't changed. Like, we're still, we still do our stories and notes the pretty much the same way. At the end and- of the day, like, if someone gave us a one-star rating because of a talking mongoose and because they thought <laughs> they're like... I didn't do my own research, which I did. Then, like, whatever. I'm having a good fucking life. Like, I don't get to complain. Not Jeff. No, Jeff. Jeff should never be the cause of a one star. This is, we also don't want another rev- like a review to come out of this of like we're just complaining. We're not. We. It's just no. We are human, and our feelings get hurt sometimes. But that being said, ninety nine percent of the comments that we see are so positive, and we do, and we are very lucky about. And that. we do read them, whether or not we should, and we're very grateful. And for we you. recognize that, yeah. And I will say too, like I. We did briefly think about like, or at least I did, um, about, you know, posting that blackout episode and kind of stepping back. And like, I know, I mean, people have commented on my Instagram, like they lost another follower, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know what? Fine. That doesn't bother me. Like, that's not hurting me. You know, yeah. it's, it's, this, so I want to be clear. Like, it's not like we're just like, oh, whining about everything that's negative. Um, no. I just, I always get nervous that people that we're not coming across the way we want to be, um, so we're just people who try to be funny and then people say mean things sometimes it's like well, i don't know <laughs> which why. is part of the territory you know i mean that's part of the territory so but we do everyone that says nice things like it it's so it's so wonderful it's worth it yeah i we i really am so grateful i actually got really emotional a while ago and thought about tweeting it out and being like i'm reading all these nice comments and it's Aww. making me so happy so this is me doing that you should tweet it okay i'll do it <laughs> Um, no, yeah, it's true. And, uh, we just, we're just very lucky and happy and, um, 
That's all. Anyway, anyway, I'm gonna pop a nice sugar pill called a marshmallow and drink my water and oh hell yeah, and entertain me, rouse me. And I'm going to rabble rouse here. Uh, so- <laughs> Give me the old razzle dazzle. <laughs> See, nothing's changed. We still use stupid ass words. Okay. Um, I want to also say, okay, I would like to preface this by saying because um, everything that was going on this past week, I had already done notes that we were planning to record last week. And then when everything kind of, you know, we decided to postpone the episode, um, I, you know, I was not just kind of sitting around like I here's the thing. I had to decide between like doing brand new notes that were topical and like you know, participating in my sister's protests and trying to, you know. So point being, the notes that I'm reading today are notes that were meant to be last week that I had done way before, you know, the the current climate right. shifted dramatically. Um, and so I am, I will say, I, I have been researching and starting notes that are more, um, you know, uh, relevant to what's going pro- appropriate, exactly. Um, and so this, I don't want it to look like I'm just like, anyway, back to normal, like back to just any old story I think is interesting on the internet. Like I'm trying to be. That was our argument, uh, or not really our argument, but our, our issue last week when we were like texting each other, we were like, so do we go out and protest or do we do right, like, right. A, like, do we do content for the show that like, right. how should we bet, how should we use our time appropriately? And it just happens that you had already done notes for an episode you thought would be coming out on a pleasant week. <laughs> so uh, our birthday week, our literally. Birthday week. Um, and so, I mean, again, like, I don't want to make an excuse like, oh, well, I didn't think it was interesting to talk about police brutality before now. That's mm-hmm. not at all what I'm saying. I just, I know that that's more currently poignant and topical and what people want to hear. And I'm fully aware of that. And I, th- I want to make a conscious effort to, to be more, you know, aware of that in the future and more conscientious about diversifying my stories, I guess. Um, and so I plan on doing that, but I want to apologize that today I just am doing the original notes that were planned and I'll come back at you soon with updates. But yeah, no one blames you for protesting and sticking it to the man. <laughs> we're good. Some people do. Some people do. If people do, that's, that's, that's okay. on them. They, you were busy. You were busy saving the world in a different way. So you're fine. You know me saving the world. That's what, <laughs> that's what I do. That's what folks. we say, Gemini season. That's what we say. Let us have like a moment where we just, you know, <laughs> get narcissistic for no goddamn reason. Um, anyway, so that being said, this is a very interesting story um, that I've been wanting to cover for a while. This is the story of the murder of April Kaufman. And I will say uh, this. I'm just going to start with a quote kind of like you did. This is the uh, this is a quote from April's daughter, Kim. And the quote in the 2020 episode I watched was very poignant. And it says, I feel, I feel it's like the worst made for TV movie on the planet. Mm. And this is my life. Whoa. So just to give you like <laughs> an intro to what I'm going to be discussing. Okay. So we start in 2012 in New Jersey. Shortly after dawn on May 10th, Dr. James Kaufman, who's a prominent endocrinologist, leaves his affluent Linwood, New Jersey home to head to work. Okay. At 8.30, he and his wife usually have – his wife is April Kaufman, and he and his wife usually have this 8.30 a.m. standing phone call every single morning uh, for 10 years. I know. For 10 years, they have this phone call. Um, And so at 8.30, he makes his daily phone call to April. She herself is a popular business owner. She's a veterans advocate and a local, interestingly, an FM radio personality. So that was her – career um not a nazi as far as i learned so definitely different from your radio personality (laughs) um but she doesn't answer the call their their set call and he makes several more calls and she also does not answer those calls so around uh, 10 30 dr kaufman contacts uh the the family's handyman and says hey can you go by the house and check on april she's not answering like the phone and she usually answers for our daily call so around 11.20 a.m., the handyman enters the home, and he finds the doors unlocked, which is a little strange, and he walks upstairs into the master bedroom and finds the body of April Kaufman, and she is dead. <sighs> uh, okay. he, he checks first to see if she's alive. She's not, and he calls Dr. Kaufman to come home immediately and then calls 911, and uh, Dr. Kaufman it rushes to his car. He's rushing home. And on the way, he calls the police station. He's like, I'm on my way home. What's going on? I want to make sure emergency services are coming. And they say, we just sent an ambulance to your wife. Like, we're on the way. We'll meet you at the house. 
So Dr. Kaufman gets there first. He gets there before emergency services. He discovers his wife. Um, he's beside himself, hysterical. And the police just arrive, uh, sorry, arrive just after him at 1129 with EMTs in tow. And 1145 a.m., so about 15 minutes later, 47-year-old April Christine Kaufman is declared dead from multiple gunshot wounds. Fuck. Oh, gunshot wounds. Okay. Yeah. So they that's what they determined when the EMTs got there uh, and were able to, like, you know, assess her body. So April's daughter, Kim, who I mentioned in the quote earlier, uh, she is actually uh, the daughter of April and her first husband okay. or first partner. Um, and he, so she is Dr. Kaufman, James's stepdaughter. stepdaughter. Right. So she, he calls her um, and he's like, and she says, what's going on? What's going on? And all he keeps repeating is mom is dead. Mom is dead. Mom is dead. Oh my God. So April, I know that phone. I mean, just even the thought. No, I like truly, I can't, I I don't even know how you would recover from something like that. Um, So eventually Kim uh, arrives on the scene and she says she shoves past the policeman's trying to get inside. She says, what the hell is going on? And the officer says, uh, your mother has, has dead and we believe is dead and we believe it's a probable homicide investigation. And so at this point, it's already kind of spreading that um, that the the death is of a prominent radio host in the area. So, you know, people are picking up on the story really quickly and there are these news helicopters flying around. And so Kim, the daughter, kind of looks up, sees all this activity going on. She turns she turns to the police officer, points, says, he did it. That's the person that killed my mom. And they look over, and it's Jim, her stepdad. And she's like, I'm just going to make the call right now. That's who killed my stepmom. Or I'm sorry, that's who killed my mom. She's a le- she's stating that a- this is probably him, but not definitely him? She, yes. She's saying, in my opinion, basically. She turns like, to police, she's, she's like, that's who betting. did it. She's like, that's probably it. Exactly. Okay. She's like, I'm just going to tell you right now. I know who did this. And it was him. And then they look and it's her stepdad. So obviously, like you said, it's it's alleged. It's not, you know, right. evidence by any means. But that's kind of how this whole investigation kicks off. So as for the timeline, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on April. So she is a New Jersey native, born and raised. Um, she's a member of the Jewish community in the area, like very active, very well liked, um, just like blonde hair, just very like, uh, I don't know, outgoing. And, you know, she's on broadcast. Like she's just a, like a really well-known personality, very popular. Um, she was raised on the Jersey shore area near Atlantic city. And when she was little, she kind of had like a traumatic childhood. Um, her mother abandoned her to her grandmother when she was 11 and put her siblings up for adoption and put them into foster care. So she really didn't have Um, a connection to, you know, primary parental figures. Yeah. And her siblings. Um, She dropped out of high school in her senior year and she got, when she got pregnant and um, she gave birth to April, or sorry, Kim, her only child. Um, And she was 17 years old when Kim was born. And at this point she was like, I'm going to pick myself up. She got her her GED. She became a hairdresser. She was like a badass raising this daughter on her own. Right. Um, she spent the next two decades working super hard, and by 2001, she owned her own salon, a cafe, and a catering company. Um, you know, okay. <laughs> just like okay, just like casual. <laughs> I'm just gonna create every business I can she think went of from and be like, successful. I'm a single mom, barely making it work. To look at my conglomerate, got it. Literally, like I couldn't. I like I I wasn't able to finish high school, um, and now here I am. So anything's possible. Beautiful story. Okay. But not the, like until now. Okay. It, 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 it right. stops being beautiful pretty, she, pretty quickly. She, okay. I say yes. Okay. It has the makings of a beautiful, a potentially it beautiful It could have story. gone, it could have become even more beautiful. I wish it did. Given the um, Yeah, exactly. So in 2002, uh, April and April and James Kaufman meet. So he's the Dr. Kaufman I've been mentioning. Excuse me. Um, and so they meet. Uh, this will be her third husband, I believe. His uh, Dr. Kaufman is a New Jersey native as well, and he says he's an ex-Green Beret, Vietnam vet, and she's very involved with um, the veterans community, and a lot of her platform on the radio is trying to, um, you know, aid homelessness of veterans in the area, and it's like a huge issue that she's really passionate about, so this is, you know, they have an instant connection, and so in addition to their involvement with veterans charities, they also both love motorcycles and exotic birds okay 
Just like we all do. I mean, I guess them and like t- the Tiger King cast or something. Maybe. Oh god! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, pretty fitting. So that's like they meet and hit it off clearly because I guess they're the only two people in the world with these extremely very specific interests. Okay. Um, so they <laughs> love motorcycles, exotic birds. He drives Harley, smokes cigars. In the 2020 episode, they were like, this uh, caricature from a trip to Miami or something like perfectly shows the relationship. And then it has April kind of in the background and then this massive like drawing of of Jim, of Dr. Kaufman, holding a cigar with the parrot on her shoulder and on a motorcycle. <laughs> like larger that she's just kind of in the background you know who he sounds you know. like jimmy buffet he does <laughs> like a shitty jimmy buffet um, how did jimmy buffet show up in both of our stories this time hang on a second we always do this and um, he was on his way to a jimmy buffet if you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah i know exactly what you're saying <laughs> unfortunately he was on the way to our our warp tour uh junior or whatever knock off warp tour knocked off <laughs> knock off warp we need hot juniors yeah Queenie had juniors. Oh my God. Um, anyway, so they are like, he's like really larger than life and like um, kind of, uh, you know, overshadowing a little bit. Um, the friends basically said James and April found their match in each other. Wait, his whooped. name is Jimmy? Oh, <laughs> I literally keep calling him Jim. It didn't even occur to me. Yes, his name is literally Jimmy. Um, Sorry. Yeah, wow. On. This is. Listen, I'm not trying to slander. Uh, if this story has him Jimmy end up at a goddamn buffet at any point, I'm going to lose my <laughs> mind. <laughs> uh, no, this is not Jimmy Buffett. Please do not sue me. I do not have the funds to to fight you. So um, all of Anonymous and Jimmy Buffett, and also like great. anyone that's ever been in Warp Tour, The Doors, Fall Out Boy, I like <laughs> the Duggars. I like how the Duggars. I like how your enemy is Anonymous, and mine is like potentially Jimmy Buffett, but not. I like, wish I'm Jimmy Buffett to. was my uh, my enemy me just so i can make him fall in love with me and we'd have we would have like a beautiful beach buffet together you would and uh, cigars and parrots or whatever is going on here i'm sorry this is obviously a story about our murder i just <laughs> i'm just noticing a little like too many coincidences here yes i mean i think maybe this guy liked a little jimmy buffett and really wanted to emulate his hero if that makes sense That's how I'm envisioning um, it, at least moving on yes. sorry no no um you're exactly right not really but sort of <laughs> um <laughs> so they friends said that J- james and april found their match in each other as both quote love to have fun and go fast in reference to the couple's penchant for motorcycles and fast cars like corvettes mm. So, you know, you can picture it, right? Like these, you know, they're going out to casinos, they're driving Corvettes and Harleys and smoking cigars yeah. and having a good time. Being bad. Being bad. B-A-D. B-A-D. Yeah, I think I think that's um that's pretty much the vibe I got. And I will say too, at this point, uh, Dr. Kaufman's stepdaughter, uh, aka April's daughter, um, Kim, was so impressed with uh, Dr. Kaufman's veteran background that she is like i'm doing a project for college for my university and i'd love to interview you about your time in vietnam for this project and he tells kim that he will do it on one condition she will not bring up the interview to her mother and she will destroy the tape afterward oh shit and so the interview is like asking kim like well what did you think at this point and she's like well i mean i don't know i figured it's not really my business. You know, I'm just fortunate that he wants to talk to me about it. Like, it's not my business if he doesn't want to share this, you know, publicly or with other people or whatever it may be. That is not my relationship with my mother. <laughs> if, oh, no. If, oh, yeah. If, uh, if I were interviewing Tom and he was like, your mother can never know. I was like, she's on speed dial and speakerphone right now, actually. so She's actually underneath this chair <laughs> and she never leaves me. I'd be like, yeah. the second you leave this room, she's going to know every lick I of feel information. Like if Tom said that to you and then you like walked into the room, your mom would be like, what do you know that I don't know? Like she would just know it. You wouldn't even have to like pretend. No, the like, second he, figure the it second out. he said your mother can't know, she would from across the country be like, what'd she, you say? She would burst in the room like, oh, I was on a business trip, but I came back for this very important moment. Yes, exactly. Oh my God. No, that's so true. And so she was like, listen, I was in college. I was like, this is like a very respected Vietnam veteran. It is not my place to like say, no, I won't destroy the tape afterward, whatever. So she's like, so I just went with it. 
So they did the interview, and he tells her all about being um, at war in Vietnam. He says he was stabbed by the Viet Cong, um, who also stabbed his comrades and left them for dead. It was extremely traumatic. And he tells Kim basically in this like emotional statement, like he tells Kim his mission was to bring the fallen soldiers dog tags back to their families. And that was kind of like something he had carried on um, through the rest of his life. And so she had done this interview um, and that's kind of, so the relationship was okay. Like April said, or I'm sorry, Kim said he kind of kept me at an arm's length. Um, there's like this video footage from April and James's wedding where like, it's so awkward. It, they're like standing there on the beach and she's in the middle Kim is and like she's like making this horrible fate like grimace or uncomfortable like with her eyes closed and you can hear the photographer go like okay one two three and then on three she literally does this like ridiculously oh, like giant forced. like fake smile yeah like Ooh. like this grimace just like huge grimace like exactly what you picture a fake smile and Dr. Kaufman like does the same and then like literally his as the picture is taken his face drops and he just like storms off and she's like clearly uncomfortable so I mean you can just see just from body language alone Ooh. this is not a super happy close relationship between them he wasn't right. very affectionate um and so you know they they live like this I mean I'm sure there are plenty of child step-parent relationships that are not you know formed in love perfect love and yeah. harmony right so um this is kind of how they all coexist. And by 2003, April herself is co-hosting a radio show on WBIG. She's uh, like a hit. People love listening to her on the way to work. She's also a tireless advocate for veterans. She works extensively for the Wounded Warrior Project and Vets for Vets program. Mm. Um, and then on Valentine's Day 2003, James and April married. Apparently it was super awkward from what I saw from the brief uh, camcorder action we got. Uh -oh. Uh, and they moved into their beautiful Linwood home afterward, beautiful neighborhood, like very upscale, you know, and friends, peers and colleagues at this point after their marriage described the Kaufmans as, quote, the ideal Jersey Shore power couple, which is so weird because like I thought people called us that, but I guess we have some. Uh... I thought like Snooki and the situation were like in charge of that, in charge of the power couple, but whatever. I mean, I guess throwing the word ideal in there changes it up a bit. <laughs> But uh, yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's kind of their like vibe. And since she's on the radio, she's kind of popular and cool and people know them both and they ride Harleys and go to concerts. You know, they go to like they go to Margaritaville. They're they go to Margaritaville. Literally, they are those people at the concert that are like drinking margaritas and having fun at the Jimmy Buffett concert. Um, and within a few years, Dr. Kaufman establishes himself as an incredibly uh, controlling force in their lives. So like pretty quickly after they get married, they're quote, quote, a power couple. And then all of a sudden, over a couple of years, he kind of becomes this like overpowering mm. force in their relationship. Yeah. Um, it's not even just with Kim anymore. It's also with April and mm. uh, April's friends. And this basically included, like, controlling her money. So, uh, you know, we always know where that leads or typically leads. Um, so, you know, he's controlling her money, uh, her finances. And this also included incessant calls to see, like, who are you with? Where are you? You know, I need to control where you are and who you're with at all times. Just abusive relation – or, I'm sorry, abusive behavior within the relationship. And according to Kim – um. Dr. Kaufman literally outright threatened to kill her mother if she ever tried to leave. So, like, it wasn't just, I you know, not, not just, you know, but, like, it wasn't only these kind of... It was a threat. It was a threat. Right. It wasn't just surface level stuff, quote unquote. It was, like, literally he was controlling her life and also threatening her if she ever tried to leave. Um, and then when asked if she really thought he would do it, April would just say he doesn't have the balls so, like, she was like, this is just some asshole guy who's, like, treating my mother poorly. And, She's a controlling you know, dick. A controlling dick, right. Um, someone needs to stick that thing in a hornet's nest and maybe... Bingo! We'll <laughs> maybe Anonymous <laughs> needs to get in touch with him. I, I mean... Mm, Collaboration? That. And that's why we drink presents? Wait a minute. Yeah, what a collab. ATWWD X Anonymous. It's so much fun. X kind of warped tour. <laughs> Ex warped tour. We're gonna make a like a eyeshadow palette and everything. It's gonna be beautiful. Truly really a warped tour for sure. Yeah, <laughs> it's very warped indeed. Um, so according to Kim, there were also quote indiscretions on both sides, aka both of them were 
cheating on each other okay. throughout the relationship. Noted. So not necessarily the healthiest relationship and one might say an extremely unhealthy relationship. Um, so in April, I'm sorry, I literally read her name as a month. Um, in 2011, April. <laughs> in April 2011. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, that does not work that way. Um, In 2011, April speaks to her daughter, Kim, and her friends about planning to divorce Jim. James. Jimothy. Dr. Kaufman. Jimothy Buffet. Yes. Jimothy Buffet. Uh, She says, uh, you know what, to Kim and her friends, she's like, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to kind of align myself to leave this relationship. I'm making plans. This is it. I'm done. And meanwhile, Dr. Kaufman is quoted as saying that he would never, ever let her leave and take half his financial empire. So bad news bears is what's happening here. I don't know about that. Right. And now I will remind you of the beginning of this tale where uh, April was found dead from multiple gunshot wounds. Okay. In her home. And I also want to add a little note here that April, they basically went back and listened to April's final book radio broadcast um and i will just want to read the line to you um she says and my bottom line is if nothing else my legacy of leaving you know a really beautiful daughter and two grandchildren on this planet i really hope to god that people you know hey i could probably get a flyover at my funeral now so basically she's saying like hey i feel like i've done good in this world and happy with how my life turned out yes and hopefully i'm i've done enough to get a flyover at my funeral and like it's almost it's like chilling because it's like right, you know. Yeah, it's an it's an eerie thing to say with only hours yeah. away from it needing to maybe happen. Like literally hours, exactly. So people were like, "Oh shit!" Like something's up, and so um, this is just gonna build on itself, basically. So within two days of April's murder, Doctor Kaufman hires a lawyer, but not just any lawyer. He hires this guy named Ed Jacobs, who Nancy Dis- or sorry, I almost said Nancy Disgrace. Oh my god, <laughs> Nancy Grace, <laughs> shit. Uh, who Nancy Grace describes on 2020 as a big time mob lawyer Ooh. who actually defended Bill Cosby on one of his rape accusations. So like, this is the guy that he hires. This like big time. It's just strange because. His wife has just been killed and like, you know, I understand getting a lawyer, you have the money, but like he gets this like Why this dude? Yeah, it's a little shady. Um, He's known for defending like mob guys and like intense criminal cases. And then on May 14th, April's funeral takes place. Uh, Her friends and daughter speak, but Dr. Kaufman doesn't say a word. He just kind of, you know, attends silently. And they do at this point, obviously, look into his alibi, and he does have one. Um, He is seen walking into a convenience store on surveillance video, like, literally the exact minute that Mm. April was killed. So he pretty much has a clear alibi. But he could have also paid someone else to do it if he's paying, like, this big shot lawyer also, you know? Well, yeah. Well, yeah, that's an interesting shot. I guess it could happen. It was a (laughs) twist. It was a, a little a little twist tie that you uh you unraveled you real mix. quick. <laughs> it did unravel you can't very fool quickly. me. <laughs> Nothing gets past M Anonymous Schultz. Okay. It <laughs> was M Anonymous Buffet. What's wrong with you? I'm sorry, I forgot you guys got married on the beach to that beautiful ceremony. Me and Jimothy go way back. You know, you don't know you don't have to know our entire history. <laughs> me and Jimothy. Okay. Um, right. So he has this alibi, quote unquote. And around this time, Kim meets her stepdad at a restaurant to speak with him. But basically, all he says is, I have a very good attorney and I have been advised not to speak with anyone, including you. So she leaves. She's like, fuck this. And that's the last time they ever speak to each other. So the investigation into April's murder unfortunately stalls pretty quickly. Um, it, it turns out like it was later said it wasn't necessarily sloppy investigating, but almost an omission of investigating, which to me personally sounds like sloppy investigating, but okay. Uh, an omission of investigating sounds like a fancy way of saying like, we're not investigating. It sounds like not investigating. Yeah. Right. Like I think it's just a fancy word. Um, and so basically, uh, the prosecutor's office, uh, I don't know, somehow, omission of investigating was involved with the prosecutor's office and they prevented the case from moving forward. And this really frustrates Kim because she's like trying to find out who the hell did this to her mother. And she thinks she knows. And so around this time, Kim also decides she's going to contact her stepdad, Dr. Kaufman, because there's personal stuff at April's house that belongs to her mother that she wants like family heirlooms. 
Um, and it turns out, uh, not only does she not hear back from him, but it turns out he is just selling all this shit. Really? He's like, I'm just selling he's all this like, shit and you goodbye. don't get it. Yeah. He's like, you don't get it. Your own, her own daughter, she doesn't get it. He won't even give her the Disney coffee mugs she wanted Aww. that were like her family's. Yeah, exactly. It's like really fucked. It's not even just like, oh, really fancy stuff. He just won't give her anything um, that belongs. Is it just like in spite of her or is it because like he was advised legally to do this? I have no clue, okay. to be honest with you. I mean, sounds it seems cruel, pretty but fucking shitty. Yeah. yeah, it sounds cruel that you would literally be like, you don't even, I'm going to put this up for sale, this this uh, Snoopy mug or this Pluto right. whatever mug. And uh, yes, I know Snoopy is not Disney. <laughs> I'm aware. Uh, <laughs> and neither and, is Nancy Disgrace, by the way. <laughs> She's our oh friend. God. Nancy Disgrace Such would be our fucking idiot. friend. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um so basically it's just really shady and like all her friends all of april sons are like what the fuck dude you're just selling off her crap like right after she dies and you're not even letting her daughter go like take what is should be her properly mourn you know yes yeah exactly so it's really shady um so may 10th of 2013 they hold a vigil for april with all her friends and family in attendance except dr goffman just doesn't show up um and then he, this is when Kim is like, okay, I realize why he's not giving me all of these, like all of the things I'm asking for, even just Disney mugs, etc. Uh, it turns out he's auctioning all of this shit off. So just shady. Uh-huh. So 15 months after April's murder, Dr. Kaufman gets married again to a new woman. He then, so uh, <laughs> this is kind of an iffy one because a lot of, you know, Kim and a lot of April's friends are like very hurt by this and um devastated by this but also supporters of dr Kaufman were like well you know he's moving on he's allowed to like start a new relationship and so you know i could see both ways um Uh the way the story shakes out i mean you can form your own opinion at the end but point being factually speaking he gets married 15 months after april's murder yes he also immediately after the marriage files to claim april's six hundred thousand dollar life insurance payout And so that's also kind of hurtful to April's family, especially when he just sold all her shit. Um, And Kim consults attorneys at this point. She's like, well, if the investigation is stalling, then I'm going to file a wrongful death civil suit against Kaufman, which is basically like the most intense civil suit you can file as a wrongful death suit. Um, So she decides she's going to file a suit against Kaufman in January of 2014 and basically, if nothing else, this prevents from this prevents Dr. Kaufman from getting the money, okay. the six hundred thousand dollars, because it like stops that from going forward while this lawsuit is happening. So in March 2014, instead, the insurance company puts the payout in a trust until the you know suit is ultimately figured out. So that's just she is at least able to stall that you know more than half a million from going to her stepdad. And uh, meanwhile, she's continuing to work with lawyers to attempt to investigate her mom's murder. Uh, And meanwhile, Dr. Kaufman is like literally posting photos on Facebook of him and his new wife vacationing and like jet setting. It's so gross. I understand maybe you moved on, but I don't it doesn't feel like that to me. Mm -mm. I don't agree. (laughs) Yeah, it's just like, you know, he stopped even communicating with people like he just kind of. Well, what's interesting is there's there. It would be one thing if, like, sure, if, like, you know, Allison passed away, God forbid, knock on wood and all that. If I were with someone, you know, married to someone in 15 years, there better be a good fucking reason. Like, I better. But, like, it sounds the story that you're painting sounds like he spent about zero minutes grieving. So it it doesn't sound there's no way he's moved on or ever had feelings or whatever. And I'm a big proponent also of, like you know everyone grieves differently i understand that and like you know what people move on quickly if if they i get that yeah everyone grieves differently but this seems cold yes and also like this is also a murder show so i think we can all kind of probably have a bias too (laughs) against like the guy who immediately files the life insurance so probably even our own viewpoints are skewed a little bit because this is now years later so it's kind of like you know on the surface it looks shitty i think in person maybe it would be less egregious if like if she had died and then like a couple years later he's like honeymooning with his new wife it's less egregious i think if this were out of context but you're right like literally the way that the story even 
has unfolded so far it's like what the fuck is this guy doing it, it just feels like nothing he, according to what you what you've told and according to how i'm responding it doesn't sound like this man has really ever done anything in love so it sounds yeah he doesn't seem like a good you're right i mean we literally talked about how he's an abusive husband and father and like so literally like, does can't even like have a genuine smile in a picture and shit so it just feels like it's right, hard to believe right. that he found love so quickly when it sounds like he's never loved before if that oh, makes sense. That's so beautiful and deep. Em. Thank you. I'll tell, <laughs> I'll tell Jimothy to write a song about it. So. <laughs> Jimothy, Sorry, we can, you and Jimothy can that co-write. That joke is like literally so dead and over and I refuse you and like bringing the corpse back every <laughs> single f- second I can. I know, I know it's over. People are like, that's not funny anymore. And I'm like, it's my fucking birthday month. I don't was care. it ever though? <laughs> Ooh, sorry. That was cruel. Um, I think you're hilarious. Em. <clears throat> Just. Hey, just don't go. My advice is don't go on Reddit directly after this episode airs. Maybe. Yeah, I gotta keep my high while I can. Keep my keep just my. Don't let anyone bring you down. Keep my big fucking try. head as big as possible before it deflates. <laughs> oh God. Okay. So basically, he's honeymooning around, and like April, meanwhile, is trying to investigate who the hell murdered her mother. Mother. Yeah. And um, so Kim is fighting. Her stepdad's living the good life. And unfortunately, the case stalls, like I said. But in early 2017, a new Atlantic County prosecutor named Damon Tyner was sworn in. And so low context there. He was the first black prosecutor in the history of the county. And many saw him as kind of like the much needed savior at the time. Um, They thought he was going to like revitalize, you know, the the status of a lot of these cases and to that end he did demand that all 140 cold cases be re-examined he asked law enforcement to present uh the most solvable case uh okay. which in my mind is who knows what that means i guess in the eyes of law enforcement as far as like the most solvable case and basically they all agree that april's case is the most solvable and so that is the first one that they kind of dive into oh, okay and he contacts Kim, uh, and she is stunned. It's been five years since her mom's murder, and she's like, "I've been just waiting for someone to listen to it's me like and like, look into this, yeah, and like want to help." And she's just like pulling all her weight here, and finally, someone is going to step in and help her. So she's extremely grateful. And literally within his first month um, on duty, Tyner meets with Kim and her lawyers, and they decide to get started on this case. And I also want to throw out there, I. I um, how do I say this I don't know much about this guy I will say I I researched him in the context of this week because obviously it, you know it's suddenly really relevant um you know he's the first black prosecutor in the area um you know le- criminal cases etc but at the same time when I searched for him um there was definitely uh I guess some disagreeable thing like like he had a, hmm. a, a- he had a checkered past no i just think the way that he's been kind of presenting what's going on as far as like you know saying like this isn't the way you should be protesting like oh, okay. looting is danger you know just a lot of things where i'm like well that's not quite gotcha the whole story sorry allison you know, ran so... in and i got distracted so i was trying to jump oh back jesus in no i didn't even see that sorry oh you missed her literally ducking right here she started here and then she didn't exist here. So, <laughs> oh well, no, I did not see that. Uh, she's very sneaky. But so his, uh, I guess then, would it be safe to say that like he just has kind of disagreeable views of what's going on, or I guess and a disagreeable again is like maybe it's just me and my own opinions, you know, whatever. But he I has think some it's, controversial it's... beliefs. I suppose so. Okay. Yes. He's not full. Uh, yeah. And again, like I hesitate to say that because it's like, you know, again, like it's obviously awesome that this, this guy's the first black prosecutor and like, that's huge. And like, obviously, um, but I also want to give a caveat that like, there's definitely been some controversy. Um, and I will say too, there was a, I believe a, a death, a shooting death of a, of a young black man in, april or may in his under his jurisdiction and that went pretty controversial so i just want to point out like i'm not just saying like not oh, a perfect you know, man. this this guy's saving everybody like i know that there's a lot uh behind his career but for what it's worth you know he's stepped up and told kim like hey we're gonna solve your mom's murder in this so. case he is doing some good things 
Yes. What I was hoping to find is that I would Google him and he would be like this huge advocate for what's going on. And like, no, sometimes I'm sure there's Google so... disappoints. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes Twitter disappoints is what I'll tell you. Yikes. Shockingly. But I will say too, like, uh, you know, I mean, it, I'm sure there's so many politics behind what he does being elect, you know, being uh, put in this position. And I don't know. So I, that's just what I'm saying is uh, I was kind of like, oh, you know, like, right. well, that's not as a. Uh, Exciting as I thought I'd be able to like champion this person, you know, right. whatever. Okay. Point being to that end, he demands that all these cold cases be open, asks which one is the most solvable. And they say April's murder is the most solvable. So he contacts April's daughter, Kim, and she's like, holy shit, finally someone is looking into this, which is great. So they meet um, and he's like, let's get these lawyers to unpack all of this evidence. So they take, it takes them three hours for them to unpack all just like unpack all the evidence like oh, physically shit. that they had at first i thought unpack it like mentally yeah conversationally but like no like <laughs> literally taking it out of boxes so that's how much they had um to go on and they, they uh, closed that case like it wasn't solvable it wasn't closed it was just like not paid attention to unsolved it was, it was just unloved. like it, it, it wasn't loved it wasn't it wasn't given the tender love and you know a little bit of sunshine a little sprinkle of water that it deserved yeah um and so basically oh i just kicked the camera um basically they unpacked all this evidence and i mean just because you know just because lawyers have evidence it doesn't mean something's going to actually be taken by into consideration by law enforcement or you know whatever like there are plenty of times where somebody takes on a case by themselves like a civilian and um or a lawyer and like no one's going to give them the time of day, so nothing's going to happen. Right. So they already have all this built up, which is great. And the most compelling piece of evidence they have is a four and a half hour video deposition of good old Dr. Jim Kaufman. And this is basically four and a half hours straight of him getting grilled um, and him answering questions on everything from his love of guns to the moment he first saw his wife's dead body. So it's just like this four and a half hour thing of just like we can sit here and watch it and like see if there's anything we can take apart and like use against him um excuse me so they're watching this and like one of the investigators says at this point which i thought was really interesting he's like i like to just turn down the volume and watch the behavior watch the person talking yeah like the body language and so he's like and so that was telling in and of itself so he's watching this guy talk and um, they listen to the whole thing. And basically in the deposition, Dr. Kaufman is asked whether he ever served in a branch of the military. And he says, no, I never have. And so. Which is weird because he's a vet. The first red flag, right? Mm-hmm. So they're like, well, did you tell Kim you were in the military for her college project? And he says, yes. And then they said, if you weren't in the military, where did you get those medals? Like he has these, like all these medals that mm-hmm. he got in the military. And he says he fucking bought them. With his fucking auction money, maybe? I guess so. Jeez. But like, in other words, he made up his entire backstory of being a vet. Yeah. And like, that's just extra shitty because April was like so outspoken about veterans rights. And right. like, that was a huge part of why she was so like enamored with him from the start. And like again, like stolen valor is not good. It's identity to begin fraud. With. It's theft. It's, it's just like a, terrible. A million things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, like morally, obviously, really terrible. But also, just like the fact that you know his dead wife was just so like uh, passionate about v- being, you know, about veterans' rights, and then he's like, yeah, I was stabbed by the Viet Cong, and I saved all these guys, you know, uh, memories. Also, like the research that would have to go into the storytelling you would be expected to give in your lies for years well but that's why he had her destroy the tape because he was probably oh. like i'm just gonna make this shit up and not and don't tell your mother because right. who knows what i told her and i'm just gonna make up another fanciful right to story. like make sure he didn't like mess up his uh his tail his tail yeah but also that's so fucking shady too because it's like what even is the point like what are you trying to accomplish if your stepdaughter says i want to interview you and you're like i made all this stuff up like why are you continuing this ridiculous lie right for what for attention in a college paper it's just so strange to me that this was even but so obviously that's a huge red flag of like what is wrong with this guy that he made up his entire backstory and history yada yada yeah. no for sure and he bought his own medals and then went off like oh i got the purple heart and it's like he literally purchased them on ebay or something um anyway so but that he says all this and he's like but i also had nothing to do with april's death 
And they're like, well, now I believe you. (laughs) Now we can tell you're a very honest man. Um, So they ask, well, who do you think did it? And he says he has his own theory. He believes April was murdered by the Pagans motorcycle gang. No, they were at, they were actually at the Black Lives Matter movement uh, the other day <laughs> with everyone else. First of all, I've I've never heard pagans. The only reason I make that joke is because like I've never heard you know pagans and people practicing witchcraft being mentioned more than in the last fucking week. All for good reasons. Honest to God. But uh, well, this one is definitely not a good. So reason, apparently, but... this one they, there's like a motorcycle gang of witches who like kill. No, so there's so okay. Well, I'll tell you about that. Okay. So there's. They're an outlaw motorcycle gang. They're called the Pagans. And um, oh, they are they pagan? They, no, that's just like what they're called. Oh, <laughs> I literally thought they were fucking witches on motorcycles. Oh, no, no, no. That would be great. Listen, if I got murdered by a fucking motorcycle gang of witches, let it happen. That's fine. That sounds great. <laughs> no, I wish it were that um, lovely of a story, but they're actually quite, uh, quite different. Um, violent and uh, I see. okay they're Give- they're basically like the rivals of the hell's angels um, oh okay i am not familiar with that community at all i <laughs> i hear pagans i think lovely witches that's all i, I think. know you were like yeah they were at the black lives matter and i was like i can assure you they were not i see but- i retract my fucking <laughs> statement okay I, I guess i can't assure you but as of the context of this story uh a little bit iffy. i take it all back they give the pagans a very different name than the one i see yes them as. it's just a it's just a name they pick that's probably has nothing to do with the actual you know, you know pagan practitioners got it practice yes um so i will say they're categorized by the atf as an outlaw motorcycle gang um it began in maryland in the 50s and it stretches up and on the east coast they are hell's angels rivals um they have many crimes associated with both um they have bad blood with each other and they have many crimes associated with them including um uh, production and smuggling of multiple drugs, weapons trafficking. They have ties to organized crime in New York and Philadelphia. Um, and so essentially he's like, oh no, I think it was them. They they killed April. That somehow sounds more unrealistic than literal fucking witches. <laughs> like, he, right. Like here's a ridiculous wild group of motorcycles. But I mean, if you think about it, they were, they rode motorcycles and were sure. like, you know. Oh yeah, they might, they would have known about that community or that group of people yeah so he says they're like well why would she know why would they kill april and he says well april was friends with that some of them and introduced me to them and um later they researched this turns out that is bs although dr kaufman did have um relations that sounds i don't mean that to sound like an innuendo he like has a relationship with these people this motorcycle gotcha. gang but April was not the one who, like, met them and introduced them. Like, he tried to make it sound like, oh, April introduced me to these, like, really bad criminals. But, like, no, he was the one who had the direct relationship with them, not April. Gotcha. Just pointing that out. So Dr. Kaufman also, like I said, he admits a lot of his backstory was a lie. Um, but he does believe that April, who introduced him and was friends with these this motorcycle gang, that's probably why she was killed. Um, and so... The whole okay, this is like such a weird twist that I was I was trying to write out the best way to just like, you know, okay, the sharp left turn, okay, <laughs> the sharp turn, yes, 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 yes. They are witches. Is that the turn? Maybe they're witches. They all start flying into the sky <laughs> toward the moon. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay. So, sharp left turn. Here we go. I'm just gonna go for it. I guess. Um. So. Throughout the time, throughout throughout this time, investigators are still pursuing Kaufman, thinking he's th- the guy who who did this. Right, every time they see him, one of the investigators said, every time he posts a picture with his new wife on vacation or like at you know courtside seats at a game or whatever, he basically he's like, I would print it out and put it on the computer as like fuel to be like, we need to catch this guy. He's just flaunting his new you know wealthy but his wealthy lifestyle it, yeah. in our faces, like he got away with it, exactly. And so, meanwhile, Dr. Kaufman is just, like, living the dream, thinking everything's fine and dandy. But unbeknownst to him, remember, he's an endocrinologist, his medical practice is being investigated by the FBI completely separately from April's murder. Because it turns out Dr. Kaufman was prescribing way more painkillers than a normal endocrinologist prescribes. So they 
he came on the radar of the FBI. And so now they're doing this like separate operation where they're looking into his whole medical practice. Wow. But like it's totally unrelated, at least at this time, it's totally unrelated to April's murder. So they all kind of intertwine. There are two circles that become a Venn diagram. <laughs> Beautifully put. Yes, em. thank you. Beautifully put. Um, yes, there are two. Oh, shit. Why, why am I even doing this? I was going to say there are two rhombuses that become four, a triangle. <laughs> yeah, there are four angles that become a rhombus. I don't fucking know. Yes, exactly. So basically, they suspected that uh, Dr. Kaufman may be operating a pill mill and drug trafficking in the Atlantic County area, servicing primarily the pagan motorcycle gang. So this is how this connection kind of happens. Okay. Um, and so because of this, investi- investigators get a warrant to go look at his records on June 13th of 2017. And again, I want to be clear, they get this warrant to go look at his practice for the pill mill, not for April. Like, this is completely separate. Got it. So they show up um, to search his practice, computers, and phone, and they're not there to arrest him for April's murder, but for running this scam, this pill mill. And there's video footage from a body cam, a police body cam in the episode of 2020. Basically, they show up and they're like, hey, we want to talk to you about... And he comes out brandishing this 9mm hand millimeter handgun at law enforcement. Um... And there's a 45 minute standoff. And I like, I just want to make a point quickly to um, this, like really hurt my heart because I was like watching this and reading about this and like, just like the senseless and needless, you know, crime and brutality against black Americans. And then meanwhile, this, this doctor, like, just this white doctor, a gun. literally branded, like waving it around at police and they wait over almost an hour for him to quote calm down and i'm like see this is just so this is exactly this is exactly i mean thing. he's like throwing a gun around in their faces for 45 minutes and brianna was sleeping like lit literally thank you and it's and that's why like i keep seeing these fucking tweets saying well have you ever thought about like maybe if they followed the rules they wouldn't be hurt by police and it's like she was sleeping that's so fucking ignorant like i can't even begin to even talk about you know talk to person about that But point being, like, this just was really – and that's part of the reason why I felt like I wish I had had time to do a new story. But, I mean, I just want to point it out. So he has this gun. He's waving it around at the literal FBI, and they're just like, why don't you calm down, sir? And so he barricades himself in his office, um, and a standoff ensues. He's screaming, I'm not going to jail for this, and I'm going to kill myself, quote, unquote. And at this point, they're like, oh, he thinks we're here about April's murder. At least that's what they're kind of realizing. Like, he doesn't even know why we're here. He thinks we're here right. to arrest him for his wife's murder. And he's screaming like, no, I didn't. I'm not. I'm going to kill myself before you take me in for this and yada, yada. Right. So they bring in a hostage negotiator um, after about an hour. And oh, sorry, after about an hour of speaking with the hostage negotiator, Dr. Kaufman finally surrenders. He's taken into custody and he is deemed a flight risk. Wow. Okay. And he is denied bail. Um, as he's being held on weapons charges, so all they can basically hold him for now uh, is weapons charges, you know, waving a gun around at the police, I guess. So prosecutors are like, okay, while he's in jail, we're going to take advantage of this time and build a case against him about April's death. So he's here on an unrelated reason but since he's in jail now we're going to start building this case um and it, they very fortunately um as they're trying to build this case and kind of figuring out how to move forward with it an informant steps forward so there's this guy his name is jeremy glick and he just so happens to be a former member of the pagans motorcycle gang um, thank you, you know, for ones- specifying <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Motorcycle gang. Oh my god, I really hope the witches don't tweet at me like I made them mad. I I'm No so you well I said it before explaining what it was. That was my bad. Um maybe I should call them like the Pagan motorcycle the, the gang. The Pagans. No, I don't want them to be mad Page. at me either because they might come at me with their motorcycles. Yeah, um, let's just uh just just uh just define them as one or the other. I'm just gonna read the words and then hopefully they can yell at like Nancy Disgrace and not me. Think of all the pe- okay. all of the groups of people we have talked about in this episode that we have we are asking to please not anger. <laughs> and you know what? The number of them with weapons is astounding. Astounding. Like, the number. Astounding. The number of people we've probably like somehow inadvertently angered who also have an enormous amount of weapons. And when you throw in the weapons good. of like 
technology information yes and mystical practices and like anything like that's the worst they're, oh god they're all things i can't control <laughs> no no <sighs> thank god my address on the internet is like some random person's address honest to god right this guy glick um he happens to be a former member of the pagan motorcycle gang um he says he has dirt on dr kaufman he says first off he heard dr kaufman inquiring about having his wife killed back in 2012 Mm. um presumably seeking a hitman hit person hit Hit person hit person yes but there's more he also has info on dr kaufman's involvement with the illicit selling of opioids so now they're like great so we can get both Double whammy. Done. Double whammy here. Two birds, one stone. Two birds. One. Two parrots. <laughs> one witch. <laughs> Two parrots. One very, very large nine millimeter gun. One large weapon. Um, so it turns out that in 2007, so five years before April's murder, Dr. Kaufman had started leading this double life. He was treating patients by day and writing fraudulent opioid prescriptions for the pagans by night. The pagans... Mm gang not pagan people okay uh which they would then sell on the street for a marked up price specifically uh he worked with this guy ferdinand agello who was the local chapter president so like kind of the head of the local chapter of this motorcycle gang essentially he would provide these fake prescriptions through this guy ferdinand or agello who would then um you know facilitate the selling of these on the street and so he was making bank off this And so now police have this information and they're like, okay, finally, this is like the break we needed. We can piece the pieces together. Um, And so they figure out that in 2011, April had basically found out about her husband's pill scheme and that Dr. Kaufman had also, her husband had also completely lied about his uh, military valor and credentials. So when she talked to Kim and her friends about leaving him, it was at this point that she had kind of gotten leverage finally to use against him. And she's like, I'm going to get my way out of this finally. Like I know how to get out of it. Right. And it was because she finally had this dirt on him. Right. But Dr. Kaufman, surprise, surprise, was like, oh, nope, not going to have any of that. So instead he approaches that guy, Al Gallo, who he's been working with on the opioid thing. And um, he says he needs a favor. He needs to find a hit Uh, person to kill his wife. So in early 2012, they find a pagan associate named Francis Mulholland who is willing to pull the trigger in exchange for $20,000. And in like a weird, ironic, sad twist, Francis Mulholland would later uh, be found dead having overdosed on the opioid pills that Dr. Kaufman had sold him. So Karma just is a bitch. Cir- circle of sad- circle of sadness. The drug circle. The drug circle. Drug ring. Drug ring? It's a circle. A of a the, circle. It's a circle of the drug ring. Opi- opioid ring. It's, a rom- it's an opioid rhombus. Take me out. I don't know. Bye. Um, <laughs> I don't know any more of the words that are coming out of my Just, mouth. Just I'm sorry. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. So in September 2017, um, he pleads guilty to all charges. Uh, and Kaufman's attorneys moved to have. Oh, sorry. He pleads not guilty. Did I say not guilty? I, I meant not remember. guilty. So September 2017, Kaufman pleads not guilty to all okay. charges. And Kaufman's attorneys move to have all charges dismissed. So in December of that year, motion to dismiss is denied. Um, in January of 2018, so a couple months later, Dr. James Kaufman and Ferdinand Agello, in addition to racketeering and other offenses, are charged with first-degree murder in the death of April Kaufman. And um, six other people like in the Pagans gang or associated with them are charged with racketeering and fraud, among other drug related offenses. And prosecutors believe Agello has uh, had threatened Kaufman's life and the Pagans and Kaufman are therefore kept in separate prisons because they're like, well, this guy's going to be like murdered by this his own motorcycle gang, basically, or the people he's associated with. So they try right. to keep everyone separate while awaiting trial. However, on January 25th of 2018 at 9.20 a.m., Dr. James Kaufman is discovered dead in his jail cell. The death is ruled a suicide. He has hanged himself with a torn piece of his bed sheets. Mm. And, uh, you know, not to be one who doesn't have the last word, he leaves behind a six-page suicide note. And the note reads, I'm just going to read a little segment. 
I cannot live like this. I, no matter what anybody says, did not do anything to my wife. And that's probably the most coherent part because then he goes on and on. He quotes Latin. He's like ranting in Latin, including phrases that apparently Roman gladiators would say to the emperor before they fought in the Colosseum. Uh, Cornelia Puella as <laughs> Agricola. <laughs> in Aspectura as un nomine or in Puella quo nomine Cornelia. I don't I, know. You're better at it than the I am. Eke Romane, yeah. yeah Eke okay, yeah. Romane. His final words, however, are a bit surprising. He says, April came to me and said, would I like to go to a motorcycle rally to meet some of her friends? I was slightly shocked, to say the least, that they had the colors of pagans. Basically, he's saying, I didn't kill April. She's the one who introduced me to these motorcycle people. They were her friends, not mine. And also, I'm a Roman gladiator, I guess. That's what I heard. And (laughs) a Puella nomine Cornelia. Well, sure. Also, Cornelia is there. thousand percent. (laughs) She always is. (laughs) Um, the statement was again, extensively investigated. And the accusation that April had a relationship with the pagans before he ever did was totally unfounded. Like she didn't apparently have any relationship with them. She had just found out that he was selling them drugs and that's the extent of her involvement. So now this Francis Mulholland had overdosed and the quote unquote client of the hitman, James Kaufman had died by suicide. So the Atlantic uh, city prosecutor, uh, goes after the person who investigators believe put the two together, which is Ferdinand Agello, the head guy who had kind of facilitated finding the hitman. Um, and so the, this is the case presented by the prosecution. They say, Kaufman informs Agello of April's knowledge of their drug operation and that she wants a divorce. And uh, they look for a hitman to take care of it so that she doesn't reveal their whole drug mm. rhombus scheme to everybody. A thousand percent. After a year of reaching out to various pagans and associates, they find Francis Mulholland, who finally agrees to do the job for twenty thousand, mm-hmm. and they find three hundred calls within one year between a burner phone that the doctor used and Agello, the head of the gang, which abruptly, conveniently stop the day before April's murder. So, take that for what you will. Um, okay. The day of the murder, Agello drops off Mulholland in front of the Kaufman home, and he enters through the doors that. Dr. Kaufman had deliberately left unlocked for the hitman to enter. And then later, Agello picks Mulholland up after the deed is done at a nearby park and helps him dispose of the gun. Now, all of this, to be clear, was done in an effort to maintain the the lucrative pill mill operation and and keep it secret. Sure. Um, so that she wouldn't blab up about on it. Sorry. Right. She, she had blab she on them. was in the wrong place at the wrong time and learned the wrong information. And married to the wrong man, correct. And married to the wrong man, yeah. (laughs) Um, Exactly. Then on October 2nd, 2018, the jury returns a guilty verdict on the following six counts. First degree racketeering, first degree leader of narcotics network, uh, second degree possession with an intent to distribute, first degree murder and the death of April Christine Kaufman, first degree conspiracy to commit murder and the death of April Christine Kaufman. So all six were found guilty as charged. Wow. Um, and then in early December of 2018, Ferdinand Agello, who was 62 at the time, was sentenced to life in prison. And he will not be able to apply for parole until December of 27, 2073, sorry, when Holy he is shit. 117 years old. Okay. So bye bye. Um, the insurance payout. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the professional sentiment um (laughs) the insurance payout was amicably settled this is interesting between kim april's daughter and dr kaufman's widow so the new wife and kim were able to like have like you know as friend or not as friends but like friendly between the two of them become acquaintances yeah and settle insurance without needing like to go to court or anything like that so that's at least a good sign um, and so remember how Jim had sold all of the belongings, including like the Disney mugs, et cetera. Oh, yeah. So there were these two friends of April's named Lee Darby and Peg O'Boyle who called themselves April's angels. Yeah. And they were so devastated by the fact that Kim wasn't getting any of her mom's belongings that they basically swooped in and started making calls and raised money to get all of the belongings back that uh, he had sold that had belonged to April and that they were now um, getting back to give to Kim. Oh, wow. And the most like the wildest part is so that she had this like Limoges porcelain collection. And Kim said when the things were returning to her, the first item she touched, she picked one of these little pieces of porcelain up and there was a hidden note inside it. And Shut she up. pulls it. She's just like the most, it's just wild. She pulls out this note 
And you can see it on the 2020 episode too. Like she reads this note. It says, to Kimberly from mom, whenever you look at this, know you are always loved. You're <gasps> so special. Best wishes for the rest of your life. A with a heart. Shut the fuck up. That's I some supernatural know. shit. We really full circled this whole place. I know. Ooh, I know. Oh Goose Cam, right? I know. I like, watching her. I know. It's for realsies. I watched her read that and it was just so like, she was like still choking up reading it all these years later. And she's like, she's like, I keep that little Limoges porcelain on my nightstand. Um, and she's like, I just know that that was meant to, you know, that was just a message meant for me. There's like no other explanation wow. in my mind. And so when asked how it felt to finally have someone held responsible for her mother's death, Kim replied, I can finally breathe again. And that is the story of April Kaufman's murder. Wow. I know. It's really bananas. This was intense and also the longest episode we've ever done. Was it? It's like two and a half hours long. Frick. Are you serious? Yeah. Jesus. 240. Oh <gasps> this is really long. I didn't even realize M. We're sorry. No, it's sorry, literally everybody. It's my fault because I let I let my own paranoia get in the way and like I always want to make sure that I do well researched or in-depth stories and then I like totally like for 45 minutes don't shut up so then you have like it always yeah, ends up like... being long. But I think like both of our stories were super good today yeah they were very intense i was like definitely uh, on the edge of my seat with that whole anonymous thing it's just like left left turns left and right well if you are any of the people we mentioned from anonymous to the duggars <laughs> to fallout boy to warp tour to jimmy buffet to the witches to the pagans who are not witches uh, to, if you're in a motorcycle gang or part of an opioid rhombus please if you are nancy grace snoopy any of the Snoopy. Disney characters, um, or a ghost at this point, considering the end of your story, please do not harm us. And we hope we did justice. I like how we include Nancy Grace in like a potential <laughs> threat to our, our or well-being. Or your evil twin, Nancy Disgrace. Yes. Um, Ugh. Anyway. We thank hope you. we did them at least a little bit justice. Um, yeah. Thank you. And uh, sorry this was so long but you know hopefully hopefully you are in a cleaning mode today or yeah we helped you mop your floor you're welcome Uh, well thank you guys i hope everyone is doing okay i hope everyone is staying safe and i also hope everyone is doing their part however they can um and i hope that uh this world gets on some sort of positive track soon so hopefully um you know don't let the movement die i don't want people thinking that after a week you know you post a couple we did our part pics. right you did your part no let's keep doing what we're doing sign petitions we got to all hold each other accountable yes that especially goes for us too. especially the entitled privileged people um yes you know we should use our privilege for the right reasons. we include so, ourselves in that to be clear <laughs> thousand percent <Yeah. laughs> no we we're we're gonna keep doing our part so please keep doing your part um and uh i guess that's it and let me say to you right now and that's why <laughs> we drank. <laughs> <laughs>